Thank you. And I, I beg to move that this House has considered the motion on the order paper tabled in my name. And Mr Gray, it's a real pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon and to lead this incredibly important debate on behalf of the Petitions Committee. Because as honourable members will be aware, the committee decided to schedule a single debate on all three Brexit-related petitions because we wanted to ensure that all three, having reached the 100,000 threshold, signatures threshold, were debated as soon as possible so that they would not be overtaken by events. But the fact is that with the date of the 1st of April, um, it is entirely coincidental that it is the 1st of April. <laughs> but I must confess to hoping right up until noon today that the Prime Minister was at some point today going to reveal to the nation that the government's entire handling of Brexit has actually been the most painstaking and elaborate April Fool's Day hoax carried out in history <laughs> and that she does in fact have a plan to get us out of this mess. <laughs> but regrettably, that didn't happen. And we are still in a national crisis. And of course, it's now inevitable that anything related to Brexit, so one of the e-petitions that we're considering this afternoon has already been overtaken by events by virtue of the fact that the 29th of March has been and gone, and three days later, we still remain members of the EU. Yeah. And as such, with just under two weeks to go until the next deal or no deal deadline, mm. we find ourselves through the looking glass here in Westminster Hall, debating potential Brexit outcomes at exactly the same time that colleagues are in the main chamber continuing to deliberate ways out of this ludicrous situation. Yeah. A national conversation which should clearly have been led and listened to by the Prime Minister right at the start of this historic process. Not one commenced against her will and just before the midnight of this Brexit clock. I give way. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend who has been utterly fantastic on this issue of Brexit from start yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Uh, to finish. She will be as disappointed as I am, and I'm sure she'll mention this later on in her speech, that um, all of our constituents have been signing up to the, the big petition to revoke Article 50. 32% of my electorate in South Edinburgh has signed up to it. She'll be as disappointed as I am that the Prime Minister and the government, given them such a message, just simply dismiss those people uh, and not yeah. go to action anything that they've said. So my honourable friend raises a really important point and that is why today's debate is so important, to get these issues aired um, mm. and to make sure that we get answers from the government minister today and indeed yeah. I will be making sure um, that he is very clear on the questions and the issues that we need answers to. And as I said, this is three debates that we are uh, discussing today um, and despite being overtaken by events, e-petition 243313 calling for the UK to leave the EU on the 29th of March 2019, come what may, has secured 175,121 signatures as at 3.30pm today. I make that point because these petitions are all still open. Yeah. The figure undoubtedly reflects the great unhappiness and frustration I know is felt by many people across the UK that we did not leave the European Union on Friday as the Prime Minister repeatedly pledged that we would. And indeed, I know that many thousands signing these petitions alongside a small minority of honourable members in this House would strongly advocate that the UK should have left the EU on Friday without a deal and that we should now do so on the 12th of April, leaving us to trade on the much heralded WTO terms. And it's clear for some that leaving the EU as quickly as possible has become of paramount importance in order to deliver on a narrow outcome of a referendum held almost three years ago, regardless of whether there remain any coherent, cogent arguments for pursuing that course of irrevocable action, and regardless of the circumstances in which this might take place and the potential consequences for our country. And there are some who suggest that every one of the 17.4 million people who voted in good faith to leave the European Union back in June 2016 did so, safe in the knowledge that this could well mean exiting from the world's largest trading bloc after 46 years without a deal. And indeed, the wording of this e-petition suggests that this is what was pledged by both of the main parties during the 2017 general election. 
However, I only need to point them in the direction of the words of the Vote Leave campaign, which quite clearly stated, taking back control is a careful change, not a sudden stop. Mm. We will negotiate the terms of a new deal before we start any legal process to leave. Mm. Or the pledge made in the 2017 Labour manifesto that Labour recognises that leaving the EU with no deal is the worst possible deal for Britain and it would do damage to our economy and trade. We will reject a no deal option. Or indeed, the 2017 Conservative manifesto that the Prime Minister would deliver the best possible deal for Britain as we leave the European Union, delivered by a smooth, orderly Brexit. There were, of course, many other occasions when those playing a leading role in the campaign for our departure from the EU suggested that this, this would or wouldn't involve, with perhaps uh, the most notable example being Daniel Hannan, MEP, who declared that absolutely nobody is talking about threatening our place in the single market. But regardless of what each person voted for at that time, and I've spoken to so many Leave voters who voted for a whole variety of entirely legitimate reasons and of completely different visions of what Brexit means to them, what I do know is that with absolute certainty, nobody was discussing the need to set aside £4.2 billion to prepare for the ramifications of no deal. Whether that means £108 million for a ferry contract to a firm that has no ships, mm. or to become the largest buyer of fridges in the world in order to stockpile medicines, vaccines, and blood products, to take just two examples. I give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way, uh, and uh, I just wanted to reinforce her point that, uh, according to the Bank of England, two thirds of warehouses have already been full. So we actually don't have the capacity to stockpile because our system doesn't work like that. And in the, in the context of no deal, the economy will shrink by 8%. Inflation will go up. The division in the main chamber will reconvene at, um, well, 15 minutes from now, 14.52. 16.52, I should 16.52, we'll reconvene. Eight minutes to the hour, we'll reconvene. The sitting having been suspended for 15 minutes, um, 15 minutes will be added to the end. Uh, in injury time, so the debate will finish at 7.45 instead of 7.30. We were listening to the Honourable Lady, the member for Newcastle North, Catherine McKinnon. Hey. So my Honourable Friend was in the middle of her intervention when we were interrupted for that vote, so I'm more than happy for her to finish her intervention. I, I thank my Honourable Friend for giving way. I wanted to highlight that, according to the Bank of England, Warehouses are already running out of space. Two-thirds uh, are full. We don't have the capacity to cope with the kind of system that a no-deal Brexit scenario would pose. Uh, if we have a no-deal Brexit, the worst-case scenario is an 8% reduction in our economy, unemployment and inflation rising. And some 6 million people have signed the revoking Article 50 motion, 24,000 in my own constituency. And people are adamant that if we can't settle this in the House the, in a way that protects their interests, their jobs, their livelihoods, then revoke should be on the table. And I just wanted to support my honourable friend in her speech so far. Well, um, I, I thank my honourable friend, and I, I know she speaks from the experience that we have shared as members of the Treasury Select Committee scrutinising in agonising and at many times very frustrating and concerning detail the economic impact of um, the Brexit proposals but, more, but in particular the uh, potential scenario of a no-deal Brexit and the ramifications that that could have. But if anyone had told me when I was first elected to this Parliament in 2010 that less than a decade later the government of this country would be pursuing a policy that necessitates the stockpiling of body bags, I would have questioned my own sanity. Mm. And yet this is the appalling position that we now find ourselves in because the Prime Minister has remained resolutely of the belief that refusing to rule out the prospect of a no-deal Brexit, thereby threatening to drive her own country off a cliff, somehow represents a bargaining chip when conducting an international negotiation. And that is precisely what she would be doing to so many businesses in my region, with around 60% of our exports currently going to EU countries, leading the Northeast Chamber of Commerce to state that 
Their 3,000 members, and I quote, have been clear, North East businesses do not want a messy and disorderly exit from the EU and are perplexed that despite all the evidence, a government has allowed a no-deal scenario to be seen as a credible Brexit outcome. And of course, there will be many people who wanted the UK to leave the EU on Friday or just as soon as possible, and not because of an arbitrary date set by the Prime Minister having triggered Article 50 when she did. And it's because they're frankly sick to the back teeth of hearing about this issue. Day in, day out, they've had enough of Brexit dominating every single news bulletin, newspaper headline or radio discussion. And understandably, they just want... They just... They, <laughs> they just want what has turned into a national nightmare to be finally over. And I, too, am angry. I'm angry that we've spent three years not properly focusing on the myriad of issues that we know desperately require our attention. Climate change, the NHS, public transport, child poverty, food bank use, social care, universal credit. To provide just one example of how all-consuming this exercise in futility has become, it was reported over the weekend that two-thirds of staff at DEFRA are now working on Brexit instead of focusing on other crucial issues like tackling poor air quality or raising, rising food poverty. Mm. And of course, I'm equally furious that billions of pounds can be found by the Treasury to prepare for a Brexit scenario that can never happen while schools in my constituency are making teachers redundant and 1950s-born women across the country are facing dire financial circumstances. I will. I thank the Honourable Member for giving way. And she is absolutely right when she says that these are the other important issues that we should be directing our energy and focus on. But of course, all of these will be made more difficult to solve because of Brexit, because we will be poorer as a country and we will have less influence in the world. Is that one of the reasons why she thinks that actually of the 65 polls that have been taken on Brexit since the referendum, uh, 49 have found a majority for Remain, and you have to go as far back as June 2017 to find the last poll that had, a major that had more people supporting the Leave option than Remain. Is it not entirely possible that the will of the people has changed? I think uh, the Honourable Lady makes some really excellent and important points, and it's good that they are now on the record. And I say all this because the reason I have spent myself so much time holding the government to account on this issue since 2016 is because I know that if we get Brexit wrong, it will significantly diminish our capacity as a country to fund our public services, to tackle the burning injustices that the Prime Minister once pledged to fight. And I would say to those who quite understandably just want Brexit to be over, if the UK leaves in the coming weeks, it's not over. Brexit and all of its ramifications hasn't even begun. So, Mr Gray, turning to the second petition that we are debating today, in the week after we, are due, we were due to leave the European Union and following two and, a half, two and a half meaningful votes on the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement, the only thing that's clear is that Parliament remains in Brexit gridlock. Although today's further indicative votes may help provide some much-needed clarity mm. on a potential way forward. However, as things stand, we still face this cliff edge on the 12th of April. And it's unclear how the, how the Prime Minister's agreement can be passed by Parliament before that date, given the scale of the challenge she continues to face, <coughs> unless she is finally prepared to change course. And I have longed to believe the answer to this seemingly never-ending and hugely damaging parliamentary gridlock lies in what is advocated by this second e-petition that we are considering this afternoon. Signed by 185,542 people as of 3.30pm, this e-petition calls for a second referendum to be held to enable the British public to choose whether to accept the Prime Minister's deal, the one she and the EU have repeatedly told us is the only and best Brexit deal available, or to remain in the EU with the deal we already have. Honourable members, I will give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. She's making an excellent 
speech in what is such an important issue. And would she agree uh, with me that with the CBI and TUC calling this a national emergency, that we actually need to take urgent action now and decide on something and make sure that goes to a public vote? Um, I, my, my honourable friend makes the, what, what I'm going to say in more words um, that very succinctly, but I very much agree. Because honourable members, I'm sure, will be aware that for the best part of a year, I have campaigned for this very outcome, mm -hmm. pressing for whatever deal was negotiated by the Prime Minister to be put back to the British public, given the enormity of the implications for the future of our country for decades to come. And I have subsequently voted three times against the withdrawal agreement because I simply cannot support something that both I and the government know would make Newcastle North constituents and the wider North East region poorer. And indeed, as, a, as the government's own Wait. analysis shows, the North East will be hardest hit by any form of Brexit. I give way. Thank you, and I thank my honourable friend for giving me when she is making what is the most eloquent speech about these petitions and about the need uh, for us to actually remain as part of the European Union. But does she agree with me? My constituency, Battersea, voted 78% remain, and thousands have also signed petitions, be it revoking, be it calling for a second referendum. Does she agree if the, if the Prime Minister is able to bring her deal back to the House for us to keep voting it down, then it is about time she puts her deal back to the public with the option to remain. Um, it's, a, it's a strong point, and, and I make the argument um, that I'm very clear about what the potential ramifications are of the Prime Minister's Brexit deal. I've set out very clearly my concerns about exiting with no deal, but I'm prepared to accept that um, there are many people in, in my constituents who, who voted to leave and who want to leave the European Union, which is why my opinion is that if this Brexit deal is the best deal available, if it's the only deal available, which is what the Prime Minister and the EU have told us, that we should have, uh, that the government should have the courage of their convictions and put it back to the people for them to have the final say. I give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Um, she's making an excellent point about people who want to still want to leave the European Union. Isn't it the case that given all the water that's gone under the bridge, the deadlock that we're currently trapped in in Parliament, that if we don't put this back to the people, we're simply going to see this deadlock continue on right through the next stage of the negotiations, which means it will never be over unless we give it democratic legitimacy, legitimacy by putting it back to the people. Even if they do want to leave, at least they can confirm that. Absolutely. There is so much that has become evident since that referendum vote in 2016. There are so many people, the public, here in Parliament, the European Union, we all know more about what Brexit means. And if the Prime Minister is so confident that her deal, I will give you a minute, it is, her deal is the best deal available for the country, then surely we must go back to the public to ask if it's what they want for their family, for their community and for our country. I give way. I thank the Honourable Lady. Um, Hearing your speech today, it, it does, um, hearing the Honourable Lady's speech today, it does um, make me believe that, that what you're trying to do is put to the, sorry, what she is trying to do put, to put to the country is give the public an option of Brexit in name only with the Prime Minister's deal or no Brexit. Do you think that's fair to um, the 17.4 million people who actually voted to leave? Or you said you prepared to accept, she prepared, said she's prepared to accept um, her constituents who voted to leave, is she prepared to accept that the country overall voted to leave? Um, no, absolutely. We had that referendum in 2016. There was a basic question put on the referendum, do you want to leave the European Union? And 17.4 million people voted to leave. And I've said very clearly in the comments I've made so far that I absolutely respect all the different reasons that those people voted to leave based upon... And I've spoken to so many who give so many different reasons why they wanted to leave the European Union and why they voted in that way. But we are three years on now. We, this, her government has spent two years negotiating an agreement with the European Union. It's the only Brexit agreement that exists. 
for us to leave with a deal. Given that I've made it clear, and I know many honourable members share, and we have voted now three times in this House to rule out the catastrophic prospect of a no-deal exit from the European Union, therefore we must find a deal that Parliament can agree to. But my view is that if we are confident, and the government say they are confident, that theirs is the best deal available, that we should then put it back to the public to get them to have the final say. And that's why I was very proud to join many honourable members, over a million people demonstrating through London on the 23rd of March to call for the withdrawal agreement to be put back to the British public via a people's vote. Because it's the only democratic way out of this current impasse. And it contrasted with some of the really ugly, angry, threatening and sinister behaviour we saw outside Parliament on Friday by people who have clearly hijacked the Brexit campaign for much more dangerous ends. Absolutely. The People's Vote March, it was fantastic, a positive advert for Britain, full of people who deeply care about the future of our country and its place in the world. But as I have since made clear to my constituents and indeed to the Prime Minister directly, I recognise that we do all now need to compromise in the national interest if we are to get out of this crisis. I'm, I'm grateful to my friend for giving way, and she mentions what happened on uh, last Friday afternoon. I found it extraordinary that this the Parliament was closed down in the middle of the afternoon, mm -hmm. our staff sent home. Mm -hmm. I had a party of school children who, ironically, were the chief debaters from around London who'd won in the London boroughs, mm -hmm. who were looking forward to their tour of Parliament, mm -hmm. who were then asked to leave the estate, to filter out into the crowd. And these are mainly BME youngsters and, mm -hmm. and uh, identify with Muslim and, and, and Jewish children. And isn't it extraordinary that we can be brought to these lengths by a few extremists and thugs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, and I know that many, many members have, were, were, were disturbed by what uh, we witnessed directly on Friday and also the scenes on the news. And many have also made very clear that these do not reflect the people that voted leave, but these were the people that were pro professing to be the spokespeople for the leave campaign here on the streets of London. But we've run out of road here in Parliament. We cannot keep going around in ever decreasing circles while the international standing of our country diminishes further by the day. So for me, that compromise would mean allowing the passage of a deal through Parliament that I know will make my constituents poorer, but I will allow that to get past this gridlock, but only on the condition that we put it back to the people to make that final decision in a confirmatory, binding public vote. Yeah. And I know that some people feel this Beckett or Kyle Wilson proposal somehow undermines the outcome of the 2016 referendum the conduct of which has become increasingly suspect and in some cases downright illegal, or indeed that this proposal undermines the integrity of our democracy as a whole. It does not. Because you simply cannot undermine democracy by trying to resolve an issue democratically, by holding a vote in which every single person in this country can participate. And democracy is surely an ongoing process, not one moment frozen in time to which our entire country's future must forever be held to ransom, regardless of the consequences as they emerge. I give way. I'm, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Um, people talk about the, the divisiveness of a second referendum, and, and that seems to be the biggest reason not to. Actually, following on from her points, I would make the argument that actually involving the entire country in the decision as to what to do next... There can be nothing more healing than that. Everybody's voice is equal. Nobody lost, nobody won. Everybody's voice is equal because that is a democracy. We do not live in a country, fortunately, where some voices are more important or more valid than others. I think um, the Honourable Lady makes the point very well because there are those that think that this radical approach of democratically asking the public what they think would unleash an almighty backlash, all sorts of dangerous extremism. But to them, I would say that this extremism quite clearly exists already. We saw it on the streets of London on Friday, and I am certainly not prepared to roll over and appease it. However, 
There is always the prospect that the Prime Minister will refuse to change her approach and she'll lurch ever closer to the 12th of April with the threat of crashing out of the EU still with us. Which brings me to the third e-petition, calling for Article 50 to be revoked and for the UK to remain in the EU. And as honourable members will be aware, this petition has been supported by an unprecedented number of people, although it's not surprising because we live in unprecedented times. Indeed, this is the most signed petition received on the House of Commons and Government Petition site as of 3.30 p.m. today. It had received a staggering 6 million 34,845 signatures, over 26,000 of which come from my city in Newcastle. I give way. Great for for giving way, and that is indeed an extremely impressive total of petition signatories. Would she like to suggest, therefore, that instead of having held the referendum in the first place, it would have been sufficient to put an, an e-petition in and get that particular fraction of the population voting for it in order to set aside a democratic vote by a much larger number of people? Clearly not. Yeah. But before turning to the content of this petition... Would she give away? Yeah. I'm most grateful. She's being very... She, she'd been very generous, but that was a bit of sophistry that we, I think that we, that we just held. Isn't the fact of six million people, an extraordinary number of people, signing that petition as against some of the Leave petitions, as, as the million a person march against the pathetic little leave march we've seen is showing a change in the zeitgeist here, if I'm allowed to use European words, I don't know. Um, uh, aren't we seeing the, the people speaking up at last and saying we are not going to allow some of the people in the House of Commons mm. to ruin the country economically and politically for the future. Yeah. <laughs> my my honourable friend uh, puts that very well. And I, what I wanted to put on the record, first of all, before turning to the content and the substance of that petition, um, is my gratitude to the Government Digital Service, who worked so hard to keep that petition's website up and running under the strain of the highest usage it has ever experienced, which at its peak saw the petition receiving around 2,000 signatures a minute. Mm. And I'm also keen to emphasise that, contrary to some of the rumours that have been put around to try and undermine the integrity of this petition, the Government Digital Service has a number of automated and manual systems in place to detect bots, disposable email addresses, and other signs of fraudulent activity. I will... I'm grateful to the, my honourable friend for giving way. On this point about the number of signatures in my constituency, over 9,500, uh, I understand GDPR rules mean I can't necessarily see who signed that particular petition, but normally in a petition you get to a sense of who. Is it possible that the House authorities would be able to at least email back those who have signed the petition to give them some feedback about what has happened in Parliament, because uh, amongst many others, I'd like them to know that, yes, I am prepared to support, revoke and remain, rather than have us crash out of the EU. So I'm sure that's on the record now, and the Petitions Committee, obviously, which is a cross-party um, formal committee of the House, which uh, processes the petitions that are um, uh, signed or tabled by members of the public, and as they reach the threshold for being debated, um, obviously notify the people who have signed that petition <laughs> that the issue has been tabled for debate or that there is a response from the government. Um, and also, when you sign a petition, I know it directs the petitioner to who their MP is, if they want to let their MP know. So I'm sure that members of the public who, and I know I've been contacted directly by constituents who have signed the petition, who want me to know that they've signed the petition um, and who can obviously then... And receive feedback from me as their Member of Parliament. And I'm sure that there are many members of the public who have signed the petition who will be watching the uh, proceedings today with great interest. Terribly courteous, and I really appreciate it. Let, let's just try this, this new form of democracy a bit more. Let's supposing that her party, the Labour Party, gets its wish, and there's a general election... And guess what? The Labour Party wins and Mr Corbyn becomes Prime Minister. And then some of us who didn't like the results set up a petition and get six million people to say that, no, we ought to revoke that result and do it again. Would she be satisfied with that? <laughs> could, I, could, I, uh, could, could I just... 
Could I just clarify for the um, honourable gentleman, because he, um, he, he doesn't seem to understand the nature of a petition, which is a very long established process in Parliament and a way for our constituents to express their view on issues and for many years, uh, probably since it, was, it, it began, um, Parliament has processed position, petitions or, um, and, and tabled them on behalf of their constituents. The nature of our modern democracy is that it has gone online. And it was indeed um, the former Prime Minister who created the government online petition system in 2010. And it, since then, it has grown in popularity and use. But as a member of the Petitions Committee, we process a whole range of petitions on any subject you can imagine. But no petition has received the number of signatures that this petition has. And he seems somewhat irked by that. Um, but it doesn't replace our normal democratic processes. It simply is a reflection on... I will in a moment. It's simply a reflection of the level of interest in this issue and the strength of feeling from the public, which I think, as representatives of our constituents, we ought to be very grateful for that they have the means to make their voices heard, which, and this petition is a raw. I give way. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Um, I thank the Honourable Member for giving way and would actually just like to reinforce that point, that as someone who was elected here to represent her constituency, I find it extremely useful in the difficult decision-making process we're going through at the moment that I have the figures that more than 15,000 people in my constituency signed that petition and that more than 15,000 people want us to reconsider and not blindly go off a cliff and crash out of Europe. And I think it um, holds us well to pay attention to what our constituents are telling us. Yeah. Indeed, because what, what this petition does demonstrate, combined with the million-plus people who gave up their Saturday to march here on the streets of London just a week ago, is that there is a very large number of people in this country who are extremely concerned about Brexit, about the government's approach to this whole process, and about the implications of this for the future of our country. And I, I'm just going to give way this way first. I, 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 she's very generous um, about giving way, but, but just coming back to the suggestion that after each election somebody could have a petition and then we re, uh, re, reverse the election. The extraordinary thing about um, um, the, the um, referendum that we had is that the government and many um, members in this House insist that the referendum result of 2016 can never be changed. Whereas in elections, of course, we have elections every four or five w uh, years, and so decisions can be reversed. Whereas in this case, it seems that we can never, ever change our mind about the referendum in 2016. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's an important point that's now on the record. And I give way. I, I thank the Honourable Lady again for this. Um, and in a contrary point to what the Honourable Lady over there has just said. Does the Honourable Lady not agree with me that this petition and those in this place that actually support it are actually only have one goal, and that is to overturn the referendum result? No, I, co I completely disagree with that. And, I, and I, I have already set out very clearly my views and my concerns, which I actually think are shared by a huge number of people. But I absolutely share the concerns that have been expressed by those calling for a public vote on the outcome of the Brexit negotiations because I didn't come into politics to make my constituents poorer. I didn't get elected to this place to drive my country and its economy off a cliff. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, boy. Perhaps the Honourable Lady then would, would like to tell us why it was that the Remain Bank of England Treasury forecast for what would happen in the first two years after a Leave vote, when they said there would be a recession, there would be big job losses, there would be an investment collapse, there would be a share market collapse and a house building problem. And the reverse of all those things happened with jobs up, no recession, we now have better growth than Germany or Italy. Why do they get it so wrong? And why should we believe her pessimistic forecast for 15 years' time when they couldn't get the first two years right? So, you, the, we, you, the, the, many of the predictions that were made, that we would see a stall in investment, it's happened. That we would see the economy affected, 
it has happened mm -hmm. that we would see, may, you know, in even where we have jobs and increased jobs, which the government often likes to talk about, we see more and more people using food banks and struggling to make ends meet. So if anyone suggests that we are somehow better off now than we were in 2016, they are wrong. And all the projections going forward show that we are only going to be greater impacted and investment and economic growth further deflated. But, I mean, the, gen the Honourable Gentleman um, makes his point, and he makes it regularly. And I recognise that the economy was not the driving factor for many people in when they voted in 2016 nor their determination that we must leave the EU as soon as possible at whatever cost. But all the parliamentary sovereignty in the world won't make up for the impact of rising unemployment, reduced living standards and lost opportunities. Not least in a region like the North East that has been abandoned to the economic scrap heap too many times before. I give way. Honourable friend, for giving way. Does she agree with me that there has been, since, since this whole affair began, there hasn't been parliamentary sovereignty. There's just been sovereignty for the Prime Minister and her Cabinet trying to ram down a deal that's been rejected three times now. And this has been an obsession uh, of the Tory party and the division within the Conservative party. The whole country is having to, it's, and its future, is being roped into this collective breakdown that the Conservative party is having. And the honourable member over there, sitting over there, will know from his own history and his own part in that history of the Tory party tearing itself apart for the last three decades. And they continue, but this time, they're destroying our constituents' livelihoods. So my, my honourable friend um, speaks with uh, great wisdom and insight there. Um, but I'm also aware from speaking to my constituents that there were many deep, underlying, entirely unresolved issues underpinning the Leave vote back in 2016 including a huge sense of being left behind and not being listened to for far too long. But ploughing ahead with a damaging Brexit will not enable anyone to deliver on the pledges that were made during the referendum campaign. They won't address these issues, not least if that approach does not even have a clear democratic mandate, which is the case at the moment. And I have equally serious concerns about what continuing down this path could mean for the integrity of the United Kingdom as it's currently formed. And I would strongly urge others to consider whether this is more important than the outcome of one vote held three years ago, which, as my honourable friend put very well, was in order to shore up the Conservative vote and the Conservative Party support in the 2015 general election. I will give way. Thank you. Would she also um, agree that we've, we heard that Vote Leave and Leave.eu were found guilty yes. of corrupt activities mm -hmm. by the Electoral mm -hmm. Commission? And until that investigation is done by the NCA, we can't take the result of that vote as clear. I think these are, con these are concerns that, that are being expressed by many members of the public as they watch the uh, reality of that referendum campaign and vote in 2016 unravel. And I think as we get closer and closer to the 12th of April, I've made it clear to my constituents that I am prepared to support the revocation of Article 50 if it becomes necessary in order to prevent our country from leaving the EU without a deal. And it's because I am as patriotic and I care as passionately about the future of my city, my region and my country as anyone that I cannot stand back and watch us crash out of the EU in that way. Allowing such a scenario to occur would be a dereliction of my duty, which is clearly set out as a member of Parliament, to act in the interests of the nation as a whole with a special duty to my constituents. It would be contrary to the responsibilities of members of the House as set out by Edmund Burke as far back in 1774, who said, your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. And he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. 
or indeed contrary to the guidance of Sir Winston Churchill, that the first duty of a Member of Parliament is to do what he thinks in his faithful and disinterested judgment is right and necessary for the honour and safety of Great Britain. These, these are duties which weigh very heavily on all of us, and they are responsibilities which I take very seriously indeed. I give Thank one. you very much for her generosity. But there's one slight difference in the example she's giving and what happened in 2016, and that was the MPs and the government and the opposition, everybody agreed that they were going to take the view of the electorate directly and that they would obey the verdict that the electorate gave them. That didn't apply in the case of the scenarios that she's describing relating to Edmund Burke, great constitutionalist though he was. So the, the, the right honourable gentleman um, seems a bit stuck in the past because what we're talking about today is what faces directly in front of us. Now, there are mem I mean, we could go over, we could, we could rerun the 2016 referendum campaign. We can debate, debate the, the rights and wrongs and the arguments for and against over and over. Um, you know, I would say for, for my position, I didn't vote for the referendum and I didn't vote to re um, invoke Article 50 for the very reason that I could see us setting a clock ticking on a negotiation without an agreed strategy or plan. Many members didn't in, uh, invoke Article 50. But there are also many members in this House that weren't even elected at the time of the referendum because we had a general election. And that general election returned a hung parliament. And so we are where we are. And what this petition is looking at is the immediate um, possibility that we have staring us in the face which is a no deal exit from the European Union which is the legal default position if nothing changes today or this week um, to, to remove that possibility on the 12th of April and so I'd be interested to know what he thinks rather than <coughs> going over the history what he thinks um, what, you know, is he genuinely happy for this economy just to be driven off a cliff with all of the ramifications that flow from that. And I think the Minister wants to give way. I was hoping you were going to make a speech. Well, well I, I believe... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you wanted an answer now. I, I, I actually think that there are, there are three possibilities. There's the government's deal, there's leaving on WTO terms, or there's revoking the result of the referendum. And I, together with 158 of my colleagues, uh, which is more than half the Conservative Parliamentary Party, um, voted uh, in the multiple uh, options that we were given about a week ago, uh, voted that we should leave on WTO terms, and I think that would be the right solution. OK, well, we can agree to disagree on that. Um, I give away to the Minister. Thank you, the Honourable Lady, uh, for giving away, and I'll, I will congratulate her properly later. But um, she mentioned that things have moved on and there have been a general election. Could she remind uh, the House, this, this room, um, how, what was the Labour Party's position on respecting the result of the referendum in that? So... I mean, this is what is so difficult about this debate, is that it sort of wedded itself on events in the past, rather than looking at the reality right in front of us. So, um, in conclusion, Mr Gray, our country remains in a crisis. I know the situation is completely unacceptable and intolerable, and I am hugely aware of the costly uncertainty <laughs> and anxiety that this is causing for businesses and for people up and down the country. But I'm also clear that despite the Prime Minister's disgraceful and inflammatory attempts to lay the blame at the feet of democratically elected representatives who are doing their jobs, that this appalling mess is entirely of the Prime Minister's and the government's own making. Triggering the time-limited Article 50 process without any plan or agreed strategy for where we want to end up, which, as I said, I voted against at the time for that very reason, before wasting months of valuable negotiating time in a general election that only resulted in a hung parliament, completely failing after that general election to listen, to reach out, to engage with MPs, either by party, geographically, on their views on Brexit, 
in order to build that much needed consensus with every decision taken by the Prime Minister in her narrow party <coughs> interests rather than with the greater good of the country in mind. And of course, wasting yet more time by repeatedly postponing or simply ignoring meaningful votes on the agreement, even though it was clear that it would not command Parliament's support some four months ago. So I implore the Minister not to use his response to this important debate to simply trot out the same old lines that we've heard from the opposite benches today. I'll just finish this point. To simply trot out the same tired old lines and what we've heard about the government's approach to Brexit time and time again, but to actually engage with the fact that this government and its total failure to steer the country through this historic process has seen in a matter of days, six million, six million people sign a petition to reverse the only policy that this government has pursued for the last three years. I'll give away. I'm very grateful to the uh, Honourable Lady from Newcastle upon Tyne North. Hasn't this um, petition shown really clearly and, and made the veil of the people's vote really drop here? One could argue that the people's vote, you know, great and grand ambitions, let's have democracy, but this has got nothing to do with another vote. This is about revocation. And it, will she now be honest to say what her and others have been supporting through the people's vote is revocation, not some grand democratic rerun of a vote? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure the Honourable Gentleman has been here for the full debate. He hasn't. So he wasn't here when I set out the three debates that we are debating today. This one is about revoking Article 50. The previous petition was in relation to um, a second referendum on the EU debate. And I take great exception to the Honourable Gentleman suggesting in some way that I am being dishonest in what I am saying. He did. Perfectly certain the Honourable Gentleman was not suggesting the Honourable Lady had been dishonest in any shape, size or form. Uh, and therefore, I think he, we need not need ask him to... Well, uh, I, I think he didn't. I think he's. Uh, but however, the, the order will. The order will. The, the, the um, hands hard will tell. But I'm sure that he was not intending to do so. Thank you, Mr. Gray. He did suggest that I should be honest, and I have been honest, and I am being honest. Yeah. And this petition is calling on the option of a revocation of Article 50 to avoid us crashing out of the EU without a deal. Now, the campaign that I support which is for the Brexit deal that Parliament arrives at to be put back to the people in a public vote is, is, a, is obviously connected, but an entirely different proposition. So I hope that's clarified it for the Honourable Gentleman. And instead of more dithering and delay, it's incumbent on us to urgently find ways to put a stop to this crisis. And I believe that the only democratic way of moving this process on for the country is one which would require an act of true national leadership by the Prime Minister. She must now agree <coughs> to put her withdrawal agreement back to the public for a final confirmatory vote. And if she is not prepared to do that, she or we must step back from the precipice, revoke Article 50 in the short, medium and long-term interests of our still great nation. And what is clear is that however this Brexit saga ends, things have to change. As a country, we have an enormous amount of work to do and listening to rebuild, to put our economy, to put our society back together, to give everybody a stake and hope in the future. And the sooner we can all get on with that, the better. Yeah. The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 241, 584, 235, 138 and 243 319 related to leaving the European Union. A glance around the chamber will demonstrate that a great many people are trying to take part in this debate. And while there are no formal time limits, I didn't intend to impose a time limit, I just said that an informal time limit of five minutes would be a, a courtesy to each other, if that might be sense, make, make good sense. Chris Lessing. Thank you, Mr. Gray. The, uh, <coughs> the petition that I wish to address in particular is the, that signed by <coughs> six million, over six million members of the public uh, calling on the uh, government, members of parliament, uh, in the face of a Brexit catastrophe, uh, to be prepared to revoke Article 50 
and support remaining in the European Union. And in my own constituency of Nottingham East, I have had uh, over 8.6% uh, of my constituents, 9,500 people, sign that petition. And Mr Gray, uh, as one of the members of Parliament who took the case to Luxembourg, to the European Court of Justice, in December, uh, along with... Um, uh, uh, other members uh, whose constituencies will come back to me uh, when I remember them. I could name them, but I'm thinking of their constituencies now. Um, we took a risk and uh, prosecuted the case that we had as the United Kingdom, the unilateral right, if we needed to do so, uh, to uh, take this question and uh, rescind the notification on Article 50. And we took that case at the time uh, despite many people saying, no, don't do it, it's impossible, uh, having made the decision to trigger Article 50, that was that, it was one-way street. Because we, we predicted and we expected that the unicorns, the mythology of Brexit, once examined, once held up to the light, once people and members of Parliament looked at this particular question, would find themselves in the situation that we are in now this week. That the a concept of a jobs-first Brexit or a, a Brexit which promised all of those wonderful things on the side of the big red bus uh, was a mirage. It was impossible to deliver. This notion that Britain can pull up the drawbridge and everything is absolutely fine and we don't need to worry about our European alliances and who cares particularly about the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, that these things could all be ironed out and it would be sorted out. We now know, Mr Gray, that is not the case. And many of my constituents, many honourable members here, uh, have looked at some of the options that we're debating in the other uh, chamber today, whether it is a customs union, a Norway option, Canada options, uh, a su su supposed managed no deal. And they've come to the distinct conclusion, looking at the evidence, as they should, that every single form of Brexit will make our constituents worse off. And therefore, in all conscience, how can I say to my constituents, that's fine, uh, no problem at all, especially as my constituents voted uh, for Remain, how can I possibly allow that situation to continue without giving them, at the very least, uh, the right to sign that off in a form of final consent? They should have the final say. And that's why uh, I finally uh, found myself having to leave the Labour Party. I couldn't continue... Uh, with the charade any longer that somehow uh, the Labour Party was going to eventually get to the position of offering the public uh, a vote which has remained on the ballot paper. It looks as though there's been some movement and there are very many good Labour MPs who've been trying their best to get their front bench into that particular position. But I, it was one of the reasons I could no longer uh, stay and had to join uh, the independent group. And uh, our view is very much that the public should have the right if they so choose to instruct their government to revoke uh, the Article 50 notice and to support uh, remaining in the European Union. Uh, and it is a very difficult set of circumstances that we are in. But if we want to truncate this and bring this whole situation to a conclusion sooner, rather than enter into four, five, six, seven years of long negotiation over our future relationship with the European Union, then a referendum is the best way to bring this uh, to a conclusion. So, so Mr. One, one time, I'll give away, yes. You may know that I put forward the EU ter Terms of Withdrawal Referendum Bill, in fact, on the 6th of July 2016. And now we've got Peter Kyle putting it forward now. It's taking time, but we're getting there. Yeah, my friend from Swansea has been very prescient in this. He has been consistent throughout, and I give him credit for that. And many honourable members who are here today have been consistent. Um, but it's now our duty, faced with this six million petition, uh, to not have it pigeonholed and sidelined here in Westminster Hall, but to take those views and to have that voice heard in front of the government, not just with respect to the minister, a junior minister, but the prime minister and senior cabinet ministers who need to hear the voices of the people. So, Mr Gray, when we come to the end of this session, I don't believe we should simply nod through that this chamber, the Westminster Hall, has just considered the matter of this petition. No, Mr Gray, I believe it's important that we fight for those who've signed this petition and take this issue so it's considered in the main <coughs> House of Commons chamber, and that is certainly the position that I will be taking today. Yeah.
Um, Rachel Maskell. Pleasure to serve under you in the chair this afternoon. And I rise to speak particularly to the petition around uh, the, the public vote and also revoking Article 50. 14,824 of my constituents have signed that petition to date. And of course, I, I keep watching as the numbers rise. A significant proportion of my constituents who indeed voted overwhelmingly to remain in 2016. It seems that we've reached a, a real impasse in Parliament at this juncture. And for all the political games that we are seeing played today, we need something clear, something pure that moves forward. Because of what I am witnessing is political fixes by the political elite for political survival. And that simply will not do. Because if Brexit gets through on such margins as we're seeing in, in the votes as they, they progress, maybe a meaningful vote five or a meaningful vote six, the country will never forgive Parliament when we see the economic disaster which is ahead of us. I look at my own constituency, having met with employers, about the impact that this is going to have. Whether it's in, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to continue. Whether it's in, in manufacturing in my constituency, and I met with an employer just over a week ago, but also we're due to lose around 300 jobs in one of the agencies as a result of leaving Europe. We are in real need of having high school jobs in our city and also at the university, a real impact, not to mention our public services, our hospital, 500 staff short currently. They recruited a cohort of 43 nurses from Spain. Only a handful remain today because of what's happening over leaving the European Union. It's simply putting my local city at risk and therefore I will stand up for the way that people in my city voted um, back in 2016 to make sure that we do not end up in this disastrous Brexit mess. But I think the reality is in the fact that we at this stage are not seeing clear, cool, calm heads progressing the debate. We saw that clearly when the Prime Minister came to the podium and started pitching MPs against the people. And we've seen it with the decisions that she's taken where she miscalculated quite catastrophically on Friday <coughs> if she segregated, separated off the political declaration from the, uh, from the uh, withdrawal agreement that um, that would help progress through her her deal when, at the, when we could all read that this was now a blind Brexit with no leader um, leadership certainty at all and therefore people not only not knowing what they're voting for in the future but also who will be leading those negotiations. It's absolutely clear that we need to move forward in a, in a, a calmer way and that is not going to be achieved over the next few days. It's clear that the country divided in 2016 and yet that has not yet been addressed by this government. In fact, we've seen greater polarisation of our country with the austerity measures that have been brought forward, and that has had a real impact. So when people speak and call for a different process to be um, exerted, when people are saying, don't press this through, it is Parliament's duty to listen to what the people have said, and it's unprecedented to see over 6 million people um, take time out to sign a petition. And as a result of that, it is so important that Parliament listens to the public. Now, I've questioned the Prime Minister, and I have to say I am so confused why she thinks it's OK for MPs to change their mind, to vote time and time and time again, and yet not the people of our country. After all, every five years, we expect the country to change their mind with regards to um, voting in general elections. In fact, the Prime Minister wanted the country to change their mind, to have a stronger majority. Clearly, that didn't go well for her, but that was after just two years. We're nearly three years out now from the referendum in 2016. And therefore, um, my constituents in, uh, on the second petition calling for a, a public vote are absolutely right to do so. It seems that it's inevitable that short of real political fixes now that we will be moving into a longer extension and I think that would be the right move to take to give us the time to put our country back together and to decipher the relationship that we need with Europe as we move forward. 
this is going to have such a, a serious impact on our country. And I think the um, amendment that came forward in the early stages when we were looking at citizens assemblies would be a really helpful way of proceeding before moving into a further public vote to see the future of how we should take things forward. So um, I thank my constituents for signing those petitions today, and I trust that Parliament will hear. Yeah. We're a hop house. Big honour to um, serve under your chairship, but particularly to speak in this debate um, where six, over six million people have signed a petition. I mean, let's just reflect on the extraordinary circumstances that have led to this and the extraordinary number that have brought people out to express their will in this way. Combined with the one million people who marched um, just over a week ago in the streets of London peacefully to voice their opinion that they are the ones who unashamedly, for good reasons, are voicing their opinion that they want to stay members of the European Union. And throughout the last three years, I first campaigned um, to remain, um, and after the, 20, uh, after the 2016 referendum, with like-minded people, within two weeks, we set up Bath for Europe. Because we understood that democracy is not only about majorities, but about people being represented. And I have proudly represented the will of the 48% who wanted to stay in the European Union, and I believe there's more than 48% now who want to stay in the European Union, and it would be wrong that we cannot openly and without being demonized represent that view. It is also true that, of course, the people's vote did happen. Uh, that, the, that, that the referendum did happen. So my preferred choice has always been to put it back to the people. And my view is that um, revoking Article 15 in extremists is the last thing that we can do if we do not get the people's vote um, over the line. And I believe very much, but again, um, I would have to test that with the people, but I believe the people who have signed that petition very much actually also see it as, an, as a position in extremists Many, many million people would probably hope that we are getting to a people's vote where people can express their opinion. Uh, I won't give way because a lot of people will want to speak. So one of the reasons that has, ha has inspired people to sign this pe petition is the fear of no deal. And that is um, what exercises a lot of people, and that is why um, I also believe we need to put this on the table now, not as our preferred option, but before, before, because no deal is absolutely something that could happen. But if a no deal happened, I lay this firmly at the feet of the government because the government has got an option. They can either agree to a people's vote, and, and that option actually as a combined option with, with the government's deal would go through Parliament, or they can revoke Article 50. So if really we are going to crash out uh, in two weeks' time, all I can say is that blame goes to the government and stays with the government alone. So I'm very proud of all the people who have signed the petition, including 18,000 people in my own constituency. So that's the will of the people in my constituency. And everybody who refuses to listen to the will of the people in 2019 is not a true Democrat. And saying that the weak people have spoken once and are never allowed to speak again is a travesty. So... I am so proud to hear the will of the people, to hear um, that they have um, um, uh, voiced their concerns. I definitely listened to them. I have not given up that the possibility of staying in the European Union is there, and I will fight to the end. Hopefully we get a people's vote, but in extremists, we need to revoke Article 50. Thank you, Mr. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, it is a pleasure to speak under your chairmanship this afternoon. Um, the Brexit negotiations over the past two years have culminated in a constitutional crisis. The inability of our government to resolve the single biggest issue our country has faced in a generation. Our Prime Minister has refused to take any responsibility for her role in this crisis, yet it is she who has led us to the current impasse. It was the Prime Minister who faced with a country split down the middle in their opinion on Brexit between July 2016 and January 2017, said almost nothing on Brexit except Brexit means Brexit. She failed at that early stage to chart a way forward which could bring the country together, a basis for negotiation with the EU which placed the national interest protecting our economy, employment rights and environmental protections at the heart of the negotiating objectives. 
It was the Prime Minister who, in January 2017, finally announced her Brexit red lines, which were essentially the red lines of the European Research Group, a hardline subgroup of the Tory party, not in any way representative of a majority of the country, advocating for the most divisive and damaging version of Brexit possible. I give way. I appreciate my honourable friend for giving way. Um, I'm sure she'll be as curious as I will tonight. I understand there's a documentary um, with Laura Koonsberg where the Tory party chief whip, in fact, says that his recommendation in the early days after the referendum result and the general election result in 17, that the Prime Minister could only possibly deliver a Brexit that was softer and that would reach cross-party compromise with the country and in the House of Commons. It'll be interesting to watch, I think. I, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention. It will indeed be very interesting to, to, to see that documentary. It was the Prime Minister who took the UK into a snap general election in June 2017 and sought a mandate from the British people for her own explicitly hard interpretation of Brexit, failed to achieve that mandate, but refused to accept that the will of the British people was not for a hard Brexit. It was the Prime Minister who negotiated with the EU on the basis of hard Brexit red lines and secured the only deal that could be secured on the basis of those red lines when a negotiation genuinely based on the national interest may well have yielded a different outcome. And it was the Prime Minister who, despite facing the biggest defeat in parliamentary history on her deal and two subsequent enormous defeats, has recklessly and stubbornly failed to acknowledge that her deal cannot command support. The vast majority of my constituents do not support Brexit. They voted 77% to remain in the European Union. They believe that it will be utterly disastrous for our country and do not wish us to leave the EU. And it is therefore no surprise to me that more than 26,000 of my constituents signed the petition calling for Article 50 to be revoked, around 33% of the electorate. From the many who have been in touch with me about the petition, it is clear that they support revocation, both because they oppose Brexit but also because it is an essential protection from a no-deal Brexit, which is entirely within the power of the UK government to implement. It is for these reasons that I support Amendment G and will be voting for it tonight. Parliament has rejected no deal. If no deal can be, if no deal can be agreed and no extension can be agreed, then revocation is the only responsible course of action for the government to take to protect our country from the calamity of a no-deal Brexit. My constituents are, however, also hugely supportive of the opportunity for the British people to have a final say on Brexit by way of a confirmatory vote. The only democratic way through the terrible impasse in Parliament is to allow the British people to express a view on whether they wish to leave the EU with a deal capable of being agreed by the EU or whether to remain in the EU. Those who support leaving the EU with a deal have nothing to fear from such a process. They would be free to campaign and to vote according to their views. I would, of course, campaign for remain in any such referendum. Three years on from the EU referendum, it is clear that the Leave campaign lied, promising many things, additional money for the NHS, multiple trade deals with other large economic powers, which have simply not materialised. It is clear that we now know things that were simply not discussed in 2016, chief amongst them the risks presented by Brexit to security in Northern Ireland. And the official Leave campaign have now accepted that they broke the law to win by a very small majority. It simply cannot be claimed in this context that the 2016 referendum result can accurately be read as the will of the people forever and a day. I, I give way. It's very kind doing so. Um, I would only point out to her that um, the uh, Remain campaign heavily outspent the Leave campaign and that the government sent a letter, a leaflet to every household in the country at a cost, I believe, of £9 million with an entirely one-sided pro-Remain argument in it. So I don't really think she can claim that uh, Leave got the better of the options in terms of getting propaganda out to the masses. No, I would simply say to the Honourable Gentleman that the Leave campaign were the only campaign to have been found by the Electoral Commission to have that broken the, the law. That is the point. The go and that is, that is, is the, the point. point. That is absolutely the point. It is the point. The government, I end simply, Mr Mr. Gray, Mr Gray, I simply end with this. The government must act to stop the damage that Brexit is doing. The democratic way to do that 
is to seek to renew the mandate to proceed any further by giving the British people a final say. If they will not do this, and we stand at the edge of the no-deal cliff, they must revoke Article 50. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Gray, and it's a, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and even more to follow my neighbour in uh, Lambeth who has just spoken, and I agree with every single word she's just said. I want to talk to e-petition 235138 um, uh, on holding a people's vote, but most of all I want to talk to e-petition 241584 on revoking Article 50 and remaining in the EU, which has, be, has been said has been signed by over 6 million people including over 25,000 people in my constituency, which is just under a third of the registered electors in Streatham. Uh, I don't want to speak for very long, but just to make these points, there is clearly no mandate whatsoever for the chaos that we have seen unfold in this country since that vote in 2016. Whether people voted leave or remain, there is simply no majority in the country for the mess that has unfolded, despite the comments that we have heard in this debate so far. The hope is that an indicative vote process will perhaps illustrate what, given there isn't a mandate for this mess in this House of Commons, hopefully the indicative, process, indicative vote process will indicate what there is a majority for in this House, and I very much hope that will be for a people's vote. But if there is no resolution uh, to what we do, and either on the 11th of April or the 21st of May... Uh, we are faced with falling off the cliff. It is clear that no responsible government would allow this country to leave the European Union without a deal. And I just want to explain why, with particular reference to the government's own documents that have been published on the implications of, of us leaving the European Union with no deal. And in particular, I want to draw attention to four or five of the points that have been made in the documents that the government itself, and I hope the Minister will talk to this, has published. First of all, we are told that despite communications from the government, there is little evidence that businesses are preparing in earnest for a no-deal scenario. And actually, the evidence would indicate that small and medium-sized businesses in particular are unprepared for this possibility. <coughs> Secondly, individual citizens are also not preparing for the effects of us leaving the European Union with no deal. Now, according to the evidence that the government has published, its own economic impact assessments, if we were to leave without a deal on an orderly basis, we are looking at the economy being 6.3 to 9% smaller than it otherwise would have been. But one of the things that is missed in the commentary is that it... That is an assessment of an orderly departure. If we were to leave and crash out around the 11th of April, around the 21st of May, without a deal on WTO terms, the contraction in the economy is likely to be far bigger. And then if you actually look at what we're practically speaking about here, every consignment would require a customs declaration in that situation. So around 240,000 UK businesses that currently only trade with the EU would need to interact with customs processes for the first time. And read between the lines, and I'm quoting directly from the government's own briefing papers, what we are looking at here. We are looking at an increase in food prices. We are looking at panic buying by consumers. We are looking at tariffs in the region of 70% on beef, 45% on lamb, 10% on finished automotive vehicles. And that's before you look at the non-tariff barriers and their impact on the majority of the economy, which is service-based. Now, just based on these things that I've read out from the Minister's government's own document, I do not see how any responsible government could say they have a mandate to bring about the disaster they have published in their own papers. And I'll just finish on this point. I'll give way to the Minister before I finish. Um, he, he raised a number of important points from that paper. Um, I'm sure he did see the Treasury uh, Monetary Policy Committee uh, minutes from uh, last week that said 80% of businesses were ready. 
uh, for an ideal scenario. I'm sure he uh, might have misread the number. It's 145,000 businesses that trade um, uh, in, uh, with the European uh, Union solely, and the government has written to them uh, and contacted them on three occasions um, so far. So um, there has been some progress, let's say, uh, since the paper he's quoting from. Well, I should say, I'm just, I'm just quoting from his own document. He is technically, dare I say it, the minister for no deal. He is responsible for making sure that we are prepared if we are to leave in those circumstances. And I have to say, never mind no responsible government allowing us to leave without deal. He, as the minister responsible, I cannot see how any member of this House holding the position that he does could stand in the way of Article 50 being revoked if we're on the cusp of seeing the disaster which he is supposed to be preparing for. And I'll just finish on this point. I think, above all, the people who will be most angered by us allowing this, uh, allowing this country to crash out with no deal are the younger generations in this country. Because for all the impacts that it will have on older generations, they are the ones who are going to have to live with the results of this for far longer than the rest of us. And so far in this debate, and I, am so, I get more and more surprised every time we debate these matters, they are never discussed. And I'm the first person, I think, to have actually mentioned them, and I'm sure they were in the minds of everyone else. But they are the ones who, above all, will never forgive this generation of politicians if we allow this catastrophe to happen. Garrett yeah, 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 yeah. Davis. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Kay. Um, as I mentioned, on the 6th of July 2016, I put forward the EU terms of withdrawal bill to give people a vote on the deal in the knowledge that what they were voting on in good faith may not be what was delivered, and we certainly found that to be the case. It is clear now from the evidence that Britain will be poorer, weaker, more isolated and more divided if we Brexit. I stand here on behalf of people who voted Leave in Swansea West, and they voted for more money, more trade, more control over migration and our laws, and they're getting none of those things. They see a £40 billion divorce bill, an economy uh, projected to shrink by 10%. It's already shrunk by 2.5%, something like £360 million a week, when we have promised £350 million a week for the NHS. Uh, we know that under May's deal, uh, we'll still be controlled by EU laws. Under the absurd and irresponsible idea of no deal, we'd be controlled by the WTO. We've got 260 members. They've got a massive commission and an unelected a uh, pool of uh, uh, judges who would enforce various laws on us so we couldn't, for example, choose to bring the railways and water into public ownership apart from anything else. Uh, migration will not be controlled with an open border in Northern Ireland. Um, and the no-deal scenario is just a sort of evil, evil, irresponsible madness. People who voted uh, to leave didn't know that Trump would be elected. He did, they didn't know that Trump would undermine uh, trade, whether it's st steel and Bombardier, or undermining the Paris Agreement, or undermining our world security by withdrawing from nuclear deals with Iran, etc. We're in a completely different scenario. They didn't know the Chinese would abolish the limited amount of democracy they had, and that in any trade deals, and I won't give way, I'm giving, because we've heard enough from you already, thank you. Uh, we, we'll, we'll, we, they didn't know, we didn't know, we didn't know that we would be crushed between China and the United States in terms of the EU's ability to... Um, to uh, negotiate. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kay, but the members decided to leave after so many multiple interventions to hear some logic. Um, this isn't the will of the people. This is a curse on the people by people like the ones who have now left this chamber who don't really agree with democracy at all. And you see these empty benches. They don't care about the six million people who have now seen that this is a complete a shambles. Uh, and frankly, the people who vote for this will never be forgiven for what they are in, in pushing on this country. I will give away, yes. Thank you um, for giving way. I appreciate everybody's diary is incredibly busy in Westminster. Um, but I do find it extraordinary that in this debate this afternoon, there is literally now nobody on the side of the House that is um, <laughs> responsible and responding to the size of this petition. Does that not tell you how poorly the people in this country, six million who are terrified about the prospects of Brexit feel. And this is supposed to be democracy. I find it absolutely startling. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, well, I completely agree. We've seen six million people in a matter of days saying enough is enough. We want revocation. A million on the streets. For every, every person on the streets, there's probably 20 more. I mean, I personally couldn't actually make it uh, for various commitments who, who couldn't come along. We must have a vote of the people. And uh, clearly, there's a, a dying need for us to actually move forward on this. Since January, we've spent... Um, yeah, finally, I will wind up with it. I'm minutes. very grateful. And f further to the previous intervention, I'd say the previous um, debate in this hall um, had exactly the same situation with very few um, members opposite attending. But would my honourable friend agree with me that what we've seen with this petition is, is a real passion on the side of people who want to remain. They don't want to fudge. For them, remain means remain. And that's what we should do. Yeah, I think people do have got the right to exercise their views, whether it's to leave or remain. And increasingly, people want to remain. They can see how awful it is. We've been talking about this endlessly. And if we don't uh, revoke or we don't have a public vote, we'll be another 10 years talking about this, having ridiculous deals that will push us uh, down the economic toilet, in my view. It's time to put Brexit out of its misery. It's time to let the people decide. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Uh, Martin Day. <coughs> It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today in what has been an interesting and highly topical uh, indeed well attended debate, although I note that the Leavers have now all left. <laughs> After making a few interventions and bizarrely no speeches, something which I'm sure the public, the public will, have, will have noticed. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member for Newcastle upon Tyne North for opening on behalf of the Petitions Committee on which we both serve. And indeed I would like to echo the Honourable mem Member's comments and thanks to the staff of the committee and the digital staff for all their hard work in surviving this petition, and it certainly improved our processes for the number of, and the interest that's been shown. There will be few people who haven't heard about the Petitions Committee as a result of the viral Revoke Article 50 petition, and indeed I think the Petitions Committee may become a, a tad busier as a result in future. I would also like to pay tribute to the cross-party and cross-parliament Scottish parliamentarians whose work has given us the legal certainty on the ability to revoke Article 50, without which this debate would almost be a, new, a mute point. And looking at today's petitions, as of this morning, the revoke Article 50 and remain in the EU has been signed by 10,156 of my constituents, a staggering amount, although almost seems paltry by compared to some of the numbers we've heard from other, other constituencies in the country. They hold a second referendum on the EU membership by 229, and Parliament must honour the referendum result and leave deal or no deal by 129. And I'm sure all members will have been inundated with emails about Brexit in general of late and regarding the petitions and today's debate in particular over the last number of days. The overwhelming majority of emails and messages which I have received are from people who wish to remain in the EU, would support revoking, revoking Article 50 and or going back to the people in a second referendum. No surprises given the volume of signatories on today's petitions and the fact that 62% of Scotland voted to remain, as did an estimated 58% of my constituents at the time, and I think it would be considerably higher today if we did have another vote, including myself, I might add. During the 2016 referendum and over the years since, I have seen nothing to shake my belief that staying in the EU is better than any of the possible alternative deals. Access to the EU single market and freedom of movement is vital to protect jobs and to meet Scotland's need for key workers and public services like health and social care. I think much of the problem with the 2016 referendum has came from its rather hasty nature. It was a relatively short campaign of a very vacuous nature indeed. Vague mantras and slogans on the side of a bus, the proposal was ill-defined. And the reality has been made by the points being made by other speakers, Brexit means different things to different people, as the number of emails I've received from the, the Brexiteers and Leavers has proven. And as a consequence, even agreement among Leavers is nigh on impossible, as has been demonstrated through the parliamentary process and the impasse that we've seen in this building to date. People who voted leave in 2016 did not vote to leave on the 29th of March or the April the 12th. There was never any date on the ballot, and we seriously need to pause and think about the consequences of what we're about to do next. I'm reminded of the expression, act in haste, repent at leisure, although in this scenario we may regret it, pressing on regardless with these arbitrary self-imposed deadlines, we may find ourselves with no ability to rectify the mistakes after the event. Quite a number of constituents have been asking that this debate should have taken place in the Commons Chamber, and while I agree with them, the reality is that the committee doesn't have the ability to bring debates to the Chamber, something which perhaps needs change for the future, and hopefully the powers that be in Parliament are, are listening to that. So today we are debating here, while other crucial Brexit-related business takes place in the Chamber, with the latest round of indicative votes, a process which I look forward to taking part in later tonight. 
Unless a withdrawal agreement is approved by the Commons, the UK must decide within days whether to ask for a long delay to Brexit, which would involve holding elections to the European Parliament. The only remaining alternatives would be to leave without an agreement or to revoke the formal Article 50 exit procedure altogether. Time is not with us. Today is the first. The EU Council will now meet on the 10th, and unless something is agreed, we leave without a deal on the 12th. Ultimately, this is a political choice. Crashing out of the EU with no deal need not be the default. It is not the only alternative to the PM's deal, and it is imperative that we choose to revoke Article 50 and put this back to the people. We must ensure that the UK does not crash out without the express consent of our electorates. Scotland, as I've pointed out, did not vote for Brexit, and we should not be dragged out of the EU against our will. Revoking, revoking Article 50 would actually honour the wishes of the majority in Scotland. If this UK truly is a union of equals or a family of nations, as Scots were promised during the earlier referendum on independence, then our different views must be respected. So I would implore the House to listen to those points. And if that is not possible, then the UK is not fit for purpose and its days are numbered. Mm -hmm. uh, Catherine West. Speak in this debate under your chairmanship. I'd like to put on record how proud I am that my constituency of Hornsey and Wood Green is currently ranked with the second highest number of signatories to the Revoke Article 50 petition. And that's the main argument that I will make this evening because I know there are a number of other members who wish to contribute to this evening's debate. Of course. I can't compete with, with, with her. I've only got 22,346. That is 30% of my constituency. But I observed that the members who stormed out earlier, even in... Uh, New Forest East, there were 7,245 mm. members. And it, it, it's, it's shameful, is it not, that members cannot represent their constituents mm. who are desperate for a resolution for us to give a lead on this. <laughs> the member for Hammersmith is correct in what he is saying. And I think even for that um, very small percentage of people who voted to leave the EU, I have as a constituency MP, and I'm sure he has, tried at least to engage with them to talk about... Um, what happened in the election, why they felt like that. And I think that's the sort of spirit that we need to um, move into as a parliament. And so it's very difficult to do that when members have left the chamber. Um, the Saturday after the um, 23rd of, of June, I hired a small room in case there were any EU nationals who wanted to discuss and debate their um, worries with me. And when I opened the um, door to the old Hornsey Town Hall, it was biblical. There were 500 people who came in. It wasn't just people who with, um, were connected with the EU in a personal way, but it was just a general feeling. And I think that is the sort of constituency that I have. But I would hope that even regardless of that, I would still um, want to um, engage with those who might feel just as passionately, even though they might be a smaller number, at, with the opposite argument. And I do hope that this evening's debate, we have a spirit of cooperation and listening to each other. Um, Mr McCabe, um, um, when one million people took to the streets of London on the 23rd of March, it was quite an amazing day. And indeed, even last Monday when MPs voted to take control of the order paper in response to a government which has failed to deliver a deal which protects the interests of the British people. And we saw yesterday when the petition, which is the subject of today's debate, surpassed six million signatures. As it's the 1st of April, Mr McCabe, you might be amused to hear that this morning my other half came in and said, it's at nine million. And I leapt out of bed and he said, April fools. <laughs> so <laughs> at least I think we can try and maintain a little bit of a sense of humour in these difficult days. As we know, the Prime Minister is intending to bring her deal back for a fourth attempt possibly this Wednesday, but I'm wondering whether the Minister might, um, might enlighten us a bit further on that. Um, but tonight, MPs will take part in a second round of indicative votes, and it seems completely nonsensical that people should be prohibited from speaking again at this moment of intense crisis. Nearly three years have passed since the narrow result, and with every passing week, we understand from um, the commentators that a further 600 million is wiped off the national economy. That, just to give an example, having sat on the Trade Committee, things like a new computer system for our ports. Now, how could that be more important than free dental care for our children in our most deprived areas? How could that be more important than providing free university education to our students? How could that be more important 
than providing our local authorities with the crucial funds that they need to fight knife crime. There's so many things that that 600 million per week could be used for. It's enough to make one weep. So each hour, £171,000 is being spent to prepare for a no-deal Brexit. And we know that that would have a devastating effect on the economy and inflict disproportionate harm on deprived communities. Just putting that into context, the money could have been spent on recruiting 85,000 nurses, 50,000 teachers, 49,000 police officers, a move which would have started to repair the damage, damage done by eight and a half years of austerity. So on the 14th of March, when the Commons voted to extend Article 50, an important step to ensure the UK did not crash out of the EU last Friday, the action was necessary, but it's not a long-term solution. There are now 271 hours left of the short extension to Article 50. We must ensure we have an insurance policy to protect the UK from a catastrophic no-deal scenario. And as other members in this debate have laid out, the insurance policy is the revocation of Article 50. And I was proud to support the amendment of the member for Na Elanan and Ir, and I'm sure that members here will be able to correct my faulty Gaelic pronunciation. Um, and I was um, very pleased to support that, not least because the member is the chair of the Trade Committee, which um, I recently, um, until recently, sat on. And um, I'm sure many members here this evening will be giving a lot of thought to the similar um, <coughs> motion brought by the member for Edinburgh South West this evening, which um, has the same aim, that if we are heading towards a no deal, that revocation does seem to be the most sensible, the most straightforward and logical course of action to take. The amendment does not preclude members from continuing to pursue a second referendum, as I will be doing, or indeed for other members advocating a Norway or Canada-style deal. deal. And I am proud to be voting for the revocation amendment tonight alongside the second referendum amendment. And as the former will enable the latter, and I would encourage all members to join me in the lobbies. Although I feel, as I've said before, Mr McCabe, that possibly I'm speaking to the converted here <laughs> on this funny debate where the minister is looking a little lonely, just being the only <laughs> member there. Um, I'm going to wind up my remarks there and thank all members for listening. Thank you. I'm coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. McCabe. Our relationship with Europe continues to divide communities and generations. Many people see the relationship in terms of Europe's economic value to us, others as a way of putting to rest forever the terrible wars that divided Europe for centuries. For others, it is a bulwark against oppressive regimes and a protection of citizens' rights. Others see the, the membership of the EU as a threat to national sovereignty and identity. In the 1975 referendum, the British people voted to stay in Europe, with 67.2% voting yes. The referendum split the country and the then Labour cabinet and did not settle the question. Almost immediately after the vote, anti-marketeers began their campaign to overturn the result. In the 2016 referendum, the people voted to leave Europe by a smaller margin, and in my constituency, they voted to remain by 53.2% to 46.8%. I conducted a survey of constituents shortly after the vote in 2016, and I've just conducted another poll to see how people feel now, two years on. I sent out surveys to 4,500 households and 71% people replied that they now feel the people should have the final say on the Brexit deal and 72% said that remaining in the EU should be an option in another referendum. The young were much more pro-Europe than older people, with 83% of 25 to 49-year-olds saying there should be an option to remain against 50% for those aged 64 plus. Of those who voted leave, around a fifth would now either vote remain or are undecided with those in the 25 to 49 age bracket being most likely to have changed their minds. The issue of sovereignty, sovereignty and what it means to be British, which was so important in 1975, continued to run as a strong thread in the replies to both my 2016 and 2018 surveys. The survey contained many 
opposing views. For example, as a sovereign nation, I want the UK to remain in a community and work together to share information and provide mutual support. Or conversely, we want our country back, our sovereignty, our laws. I voted to stay in Europe in 1975, partly for economic reasons. The economy, as probably none of you may recall, was in a very bad state. But my overriding reason was that as a young person, I saw belonging in Europe as a break from the past and the possibility of a better future. As a child, I was brought up under the shadow of the war because my parents, and indeed my grandparents, traumatic experiences. <coughs> Peace in Europe was an overwhelming prize for our generation. I wanted us to be a nation that took our place alongside other countries and contributed to the responsibility the international community has to resolve some of the very challenging issues such as climate change and migration. Clearly the deal the Prime Minister has brought back was always going to find difficulty in getting support. And indeed it is difficult to think of any deal that could win overwhelming support because we all want very different outcomes. It is not very satisfactory for any option to be the majority view of the House by a handful of votes. That is why I believe that having another vote by the public on whatever option the House supports, together with the option to remain, is the only way forward. I do not think that another public vote will settle this issue of what our relationship with Europe should be. Communities and generations will continue to be divided. I believe the younger generation will in time have a more settled view of what their relationship with Europe should be. And it is only when that happens that this issue will be resolved. The only long-term solution to the issue of identity is going to be time. However, in a public vote, <coughs> this time people will be voting on proper, detailed options for the way forward, with the full knowledge of what a deal with the EU would actually look like with the option of voting to remain in the EU if that appeared a better option. Maybe also, Mr McCabe, that that could put back into the debate a space for rational consideration. <coughs> that, I think, would be welcomed by many members of the public. Yeah. Uh, Martin Whitfield. I'm grateful, Mr McCabe, and it's an honour to serve under your chairmanship. And also, I'd like to thank the Petitions Committee and also my honourable friend for Newcastle-upon-Tyne North, um, for opening this debate about the three petitions. Um, we've heard a lot of very interesting arguments today, um, and I would like to extend my thanks to the 98 people in East Lothian who signed the petition asking to respect the original referendum because they have a right to a voice. I would like to thank the 356 people in East Lothian who signed the petition because they want to hold a second referendum. And, of course, I want to thank the 13,099 signatories, nearly 12.5% of the constituents who signed the petition to revoke Article 50. And I do so with the same thanks at the same level to all three, because I think this is a debate where we need to listen to all sides. We need to address the concerns. It is not a debate where time should be wasted with interventions and shouting down to try and silence the other side. This is a problem that we've had over the previous years, and we're not getting any better at it. I'd like to also thank um, an honourable member for, for Stockport, who reminds us that, of course, the precursor of the EU was an organisation to keep peace. That was its fundamental purpose. People looked to countries across Europe, devastated by war, to say, how can we make things better? And we came up with the idea of trying to share. And we liked it. And it worked. And the UK was instrumental in the creation of that. And then we sought to join. And we were shunned. But we didn't take that as no. We went back and asked again. And we did so because we saw what was happening there was the right thing for the future. It was the right thing for the young people then, the way it's the right for the young people now. It was right for industry then, as it is right for industry now. We live in a world where we have a growing challenge from the West and a challenge in the East. And standing together makes us stronger. And that's important. I was going to go through and, and pick up on a variety of comments about, oh, it's in your manifesto and that. But given the shortage of time, I'm not really going to give those the dignity that I don't think they deserve. 
What I am going to say is I'm going to answer my honourable friend um, from Newcastle upon Tyne North, who said petitions have been around in Parliament for ages. They have. They date back to 1832. The very first petition was drawn up by the suffragettes who wanted a vote, and it was presented to the House. I would suggest, perhaps, if we'd listened to that petition then, some of what happened subsequently might have played very differently and been more respectful of the sort of community society that we want to live in today. And I want to look quickly at what actually Article 50 says and why it should be revoked. It's a very simple clause, and it says that any member state may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. And it's those two last words, the constitutional requirements, that have, as much as anything else, I believe, with all respect, caused us problems. Mm. We have a challenging constitution. It's unwritten. But it's also a versatile constitution. But it does allow people to say, this is what I think it is, and you disagree with me at your peril. But our constitution works because we all agree on certain elements of it. And one of them is democracy. If we revoke Article 50, as the petition requests, we will create space in which we can perhaps have a better discussion with people who are involved. I have some young people in my constituency who wrote to me, school children, um, primary school children. One of them said, we really should have another vote. We've talked about this. It makes sense. Another boy wrote to me and said, why don't we give the vote to everyone who didn't have the vote then but has the vote now? Let's ask them. And these are young people who are looking at adult problems that they know affect them and are coming up with solutions. Well, my honourable friend, you've well. Um, very uh, quickly. Th thank my honourable friend for giving way. Uh, does he not agree with me also that if there was going to be a revocation of Article 50, it needs to be in conjunction with a people's vote? We need to maintain uh, the people's faith in democracy. And if people are going to have faith in democracy and we decide against something which was decided not albeit with a very small majority, we need to not have another vote in order to be able to confirm the decision. I very much agree. You can't have enough democracy. I think one of the questions that needs to be answered is what sort of democracy do we want going forward? Because we've looked at the referendum and a group of people are saying that the original referendum is sacrosanct. We can't have another referendum. We have people who say we've had a general election. It's sacrosanct. We're not going to change that. There are very serious constitutional questions that need to be addressed and they need to be addressed urgently. One way is to create that space for the discussion to happen, and the request to revoke Article 50 does not mean we will never be leaving the EU. What it does mean is that we can have a discussion, we can move forward, and we can start to reconcile the country away from screaming and shouting to one where discussion takes place and we can move forward together. Very, oh, very quickly. Businesses are affected and uh, many of them don't know um, who they're going to employ in the future, what supply chains they're going to use, uh, which regulatory regime they're going to use. Surely we need to have space to allow them to have certainty. Absolutely, I agree. that The, the handling of the, of the no-deal nightmare cliff edge um, ha has not been the greatest moment uh, in parliamentary mm -hmm. history. Um, but I do think we can have a great moment in parliamentary history and that really is to open up the discussion again and trust our voters, trust the public to take our discussions forward. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Dr. Sarah Wilson. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, if a democracy cannot change its mind, it ceases to be a democracy. Not my words, but the words of our first Brexit secretary, yeah. one of many. Um, and I think that the ability to change your mind is a beautiful thing. Um, particularly, it's something that we should value in parliamentarians. Yeah. But as Maynard Keynes said, um, if the facts change, I change my mind. And the, the, the having a sealed mind, the inability to change your mind, is something that, that we should be very careful of. Um, and that's where we are at the moment, I'm afraid. We're in a situation where people seem incapable of changing their minds. But the public isn't. 
um, the public, and it's very difficult to quote figures for the number of people who signed article, sorry, signed the revoke petition because it's changing. Uh, when we started this debate, it was running at 6,036,045, but uh, last time I checked a couple of minutes ago, it was uh, 6,037,286, and 10,804 of those were in my constituency, and that's almost 16% of the electorate. But I'd also like to pay tribute to the 355 people who signed the Leave Deal or No Deal petition, because I think we should recognise their voices in this debate, and also the 496 who signed the petition for the second referendum. But as I say, there are lots of reasons to change your mind. And a good reason to change your mind is because the circumstances change, uh, but another reason is because you've looked at the evidence. And I come to this seeing both sides of the debate because I started out originally when the referendum campaign was launched um, as a, a soft leave Eurosceptic. But as chair of the Health and Social Care Committee, I sat as chair of that committee week in, week out, hearing the evidence of harm. And, and I came to the, the view that I had, was wrong. And I wasn't afraid to say that. In fact, many colleagues said to me, well, don't tell people that you've changed your mind. Just put a cross in a different box because it'll be very bad for your political career if you change your mind. And I thought, well, that's astonishing that, that we've come to this, that parliamentarians aren't honest when they've looked at the evidence and they are prepared to change their minds based on that evidence. And, and one of the things that I think we perhaps talk about too much, well, not too much, but we, we focus on, is this idea that it's all about a WTO Brexit, it's all about trade. But for me, sitting, chairing the Health and Social Care Committee, it became very obvious to me that it was, as far as health and social care and science and research is concerned, <coughs> it was more about the clear evidence of harm, of unpicking more than four decades of a really close relationship that has brought enormous benefit. And, and I looked at the harms about what it would do for science and research. There is no version of Brexit that will benefit science and research. There's no version of ben Brexit that's going to improve the situation for our health and social care workforce. There's no version of Brexit, really, that's going to do anything positive for the NHS in terms of funding. And, and of course, the, the biggest non-fact of all of the referendum campaign, the most remembered non-fact, was the 350 million a week for the NHS that never was. And not only did those who were leading the Vote Leave <coughs> campaign know that that was wrong, but they valued the fact that people were quoting that figure and there was a debate. I was in rooms with people who said to me, Yes, we know the fact is wrong. It's not a fact. It's a, it's a net figure. Um, not, it's, sorry, it's a gross figure rather than a net figure. But they were prepared to keep saying it. And many of these people are now sitting on the front bench. Um, it is quite extraordinary. And so I think that we do have to consider the big picture here about the extent to which people were misled knowingly and deliberately um, around the, uh, the, the referendum campaign. But we have to consider the very real evidence that has emerged in every area of the degree of harm. And we have to be honest about the fact that there were very many different versions of Brexit. And as a former clinician, I've, I've said this before, that if you can consider how ridiculous it would be if you took someone into an operating theatre over a thousand days after they signed a vague consent form that consented to an operation of some sort, um, well, the surgeon would be struck off. Um, the surgeon in this case, I'm afraid, is our Prime Minister. And she has a duty, now that we know all the circumstances of Brexit, and once we've settled on a version where people can go back and weigh up the risks and benefits of a known deal. That's what's required in order to give consent. And particularly for young people, we're, we're taking people into the operating theatre kicking and screaming with a consent form signed by their grandparents. And uh, we absolutely owe it to check that we have the valid consent 
of the British people before we carry out this extraordinary act of constitutional, social and economic sur um, surgery on the population. And, and we have time to do so. We should take the, part of the time, and revocation is one way that we could do that, to reflect, revoke and reflect. And as, my, as the Honourable Gentleman has said, it doesn't mean to say that that cancels Brexit altogether. It just gives us the chance to pause and to recognise that this is such a significant decision. But we should just take the time to make sure that we get it right. Um, and going back to that point about changing your mind, there are many good reasons to change your mind. But there are some reasons to change your mind that are less honourable. Um, changing your mind because it suits your leadership ambition, perhaps. <laughs> Um, changing your mind because this has all become about the unity of the Conservative Party. Um, I think the country looks on in horror and does not see that as a reason to change your mind, um, or indeed a reason to stick rigidly to a point of view when all the evidence is so compelling that you should do so. And, and one thing that my constituents say to me, many of them, over and again, is why is it that all of you get to change your minds so many times, um, but none of us do. And that's what they want. They just want the ability to reflect that many of them have changed their minds. And, and I was there last weekend with the million people, an extraordinary positive outpouring from all around the country um, of people just asking the Prime Minister, walking past her door peacefully and asking her, to put it to the people. And I would contrast that with the crowds that were outside the gate when I cycled out last Friday, um, screaming at me, traitor, bitch, and other parts of my anatomy, um, in, in, a, in a really disgusting outpouring of hostility. And, and I think that when I hear the Prime Minister and others say that we can't put this back to the people, because it will unleash dark forces in our society and division. I would say those dark forces and division are already out there. And you don't actually counter the far right by appeasing them. You counter them by standing firm. And since when did this country not have a democratic process because we were afraid of the far right? Um, well, I and many colleagues in this house have, have actually had to face that blast full on. Um, and I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to keep saying it loud and clear. It's time that we put this back to the people. Yeah. Yeah. Neil Coyle. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair. And can I congratulate my honourable friend and member for Newcastle upon Tyne North for a brilliant uh, opening speech to this debate and for being a brilliant MP for my dad. <laughs> um, um, I want to make four brief points, although there are some, some sub points to anyone thinks that might be too short. Um, it's, it's the first is it's three years since 37% of the eligible electorate voted to leave, and it is two years since the Prime Minister triggered. Article 50. Uh, uh, someone described that earlier as prematurely, uh, Mr Chair. I think that's an understatement. Uh, um, I, I think to, to describe it as premature is not sufficient. It was reckless in the extreme. I voted against you in Article 50. I'm proud to have done so. And I believe everything we have seen since justifies that decision and all of those who voted against at that particular point. Um, secondly, I, I'm speaking to back the, uh, the uh, petition supporting a new people's vote and revoking Article 50. And I do it on behalf of an inner London constituency with a, a, a more significant economic cushion. Others have spoken about some of the harm and the potential speed and depth of harm to their uh, constituencies that come from uh, Brexit. But I, I do also want to challenge that the, the idea that this is somehow a north-south divide or a more affluent versus more disadvantaged community uh, debate, because that is simply not true. I have 43% child poverty in some wards in the constituency. I have hundreds of working people relying on food banks under this government. And I have a, a, a very significant homeless and rough sleeping population. It is, it, 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 we, are, we should all be speaking to the additional damage Brexit does to our constituencies. There is no constituency that will be better off as a result of any form of Brexit. Um, and I, I think we, we would be doing a disservice if we ignored the demographics from 16 referendum or uh, the change that we've seen since. It should surprise no one that the vast majority of our black and minority ethnic uh, voters chose to vote remain. They are sick 
of the uh, foul press narrative emboldened by this government uh, on immigration. Immigrants make a net contribution positively to this country and we should not be ashamed of making that case. Um, also, more women voted to remain. Every group of employed people, full-time, part-time, self-employed, you name it, voted uh, in, by majority to remain. And overwhelming numbers of young people where they voted, voted to remain. The two significant groups who voted to leave were older people and unemployed people. Um, the government is ignoring the change uh, since 2016, and it does it at its own peril. Where will its voters come from in future? And, of course, uh, it does help explain, the demographic change does help explain, why the government is scared of going back to the people for a new vote, I believe. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of the damage I've seen, even in an inner London constituency. So I talked to um, employers and businesses from uh, uh, across my uh, dynamic and vibrant uh, constituency. Um, in recruitment, it's hospitality, it's, it's construction, it's the public sector that are all struggling already before we get to any potential deal or a crash out under no deal. It, I've seen two uh, financial sector firms move to Frankfurt. I've seen investment that would otherwise have been going to the Elephant and Castle move to Amsterdam from different businesses. And, of course, we've seen damage in terms of democracy. We have seen the rise in hate. And I echo the, the, the points of uh, uh, the Honourable Member Topness, um, who, who, who speaks about what we saw on Friday. I personally think it is, uh, it is deeply shameful that a neo-fascist was allowed to speak anywhere near the cenotaph in our capital city. But we've seen hate elsewhere grow. And we know now, more than we knew before, Putin's influence about the, uh, the, the depth of law-breaking and overspending and criminality. We knew, some of us knew they were liars on the side of the bus. We had no idea the depth of the liars and criminality that was going on inside that bus back just three years ago. And of course, voters are being treated as though they are stupid now. For the person who was Home Secretary in 2016 to have been telling voters uh, it will damage our national security and our economy if we leave the European Union, to pretend now as Prime Minister that her deal or any other offering does anything but uh, that is, it, it's, it's fooling no one. Voters are not stupid and should not be treated as such. It is absurd to make one claim then and a completely counterclaim uh, now. And I think for, that's some of the reasons why this petition has grown. In particular, the revoke petition has grown uh, so fast and so furious since it was first launched. In uh, Southwark, uh, in my own constituency, 25,000 people have, have signed this particular petition. And in the uh, borough as a whole, across two and a half constituencies, some 75 5,000 people have signed the petition to revoke. That is more than double the number of people who voted leave in our borough back in 2016. And of course, the Prime Minister claims she has the support of the people for her, uh, for her pitiful offering, um, but there is no petition for her deal. It doesn't exist because the public support simply doesn't exist. And I wager that if it even went up, I doubt it would have as many uh, votes as there are numbers of people in the Cabinet, quite frankly, given what we've seen over the last few weeks. But um, it is also why, I think, it, 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 finally, uh, Chair, uh, even in Birmingham and in a very heavily Remain constituency, I have spoken to multiple people who shifted since... Uh, 2016, and, and many more who still support Leave, who don't support the, the, certainly don't support the Prime Minister's deal, uh, uh, and do support public vote. But some of those voters who have shifted include a prison officer, a banker, and a teacher. And a man on Friday who came in with his best friend, who's Portuguese, who's now worried about her rights here going forward. They recognise the crisis we're in. They recognise the damage that we've seen. They want to revoke Article 50, and they want a say themselves on whatever uh, course this. Uh, this, this, this country chooses to take. And today, are we voting for those reasons, for those people? Thank you. Brock. Thank you very much, Mr McCabe, and a great pleasure to uh, serve under your chairship. Um, I want to start off firstly by saying what are some terrific contributions in today's debate. Um, I appreciated particularly the Newcastle on Time, the Honourable Member for Newcastle on Time North <laughs> uh, contribution. It was very wide-ranging and covered a great deal of points so I, thought, I, I very much agreed with. Um, and I, I thought the one thing that really stuck out for me was her speaking about the very different visions of what Brexit meant and that no one was talking and trying to pull those different visions together into some sort of whole, and I'll be addressing that further uh, uh, in my speech. Um, the uh, Right Honourable Member from Nottingham East spoke of the mirage of Brexit, which I thought was a, a terrific term that really 
um, s makes it very clear about the sort of, um, in some cases, nonsense that was told to us by those people who supported Brexit um, that they were offering those people who were eventually going to be voting on it, and I think describing it as a mirage is particularly apt. Um, the Honourable Member for York Central spoke of the country never forgiving Parliament uh, and also mentioned citizens' assemblies, which is certainly something that I think should be considered more closely. Um, the Right Honourable Member for Streatham quite rightly reminded us of the younger generation and the importance of these decisions on their lives and how we must be considering them uh, at all times um, as as those who are in place now and, and of certain, uh, a certain generation, um, in my case, uh, and we, 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 need to re we need to remember them at all times. We are creating their future in this place. And frankly, uh, if we pursue this Brexit, uh, a very poor future it will be for them. Uh, and I include my own children. Uh, in that consideration as well. Honourable Member for Lynn Lithgow and East Falkirk um, gave a terrific speech. Thank you. Uh, I'd have to thank him for, for that. I thought uh, it was very measured and considered and uh, I agreed with everything he, he said. Um, and also the Honourable Member for East Lothian talked, reminded us that ultimately this is a political choice. And that must be remembered when all our votes tonight and all of our considerations of this incredibly important issue. Um, I have to uh, particularly mark out the Honourable Member for Totnes's contribution, which was extremely frank. Um, she too spoke of these many different versions of Brexit uh, and, and, and her condemning of the hostility that has arisen uh, in recent weeks in particular, um, I thought hit the nail right on the head. And the way she spoke of this whole debate unleashing dark forces um, and division and that we must stand up to those. We do not appease the far right by, um, appeasing, uh, by appeasing them. Um, there is, though, a call that rings out from Brexiters that we must respect the will of the people in the 2016 referendum. And the question that keeps occurring to me is... What was that will that was expressed? For some, it was perhaps the 350 million quid a week for the NHS, and they may be very disappointed when that doesn't arrive. For others, it may be the higher wages that were promised during the Leave campaign, a benefit that doesn't seem to be appearing any time soon. Some may have been wooed by the scrapping of VAT that was promised, but we've heard almost nothing about since, or perhaps it was the easiest pie trade deals that we were supposed to have dozens of by now. Or was it alternatively the UK-EU trade deal that we were going to have by May next year, or the new immigration system we were supposed to have by then? The one thing we still have is the pledge that there will be no change to the operation of the Irish border, as promised by the Honourable Members for Surrey Heath, for Uxbridge and South Ruislip, and for Witham in a Vote Leave news release of June the 1st, 2016. The one promise left standing is the one that seems to be causing all the, pro the problems between the Tories and the DUP. Uh, in spite of all the fluff and flannel since, uh, flannel since 2016, it is fairly clear that leave never meant leave and Brexit never meant Brexit. In the blizzard of reasons for voting one way or another, there was never a manifesto, never a plan for what happens afterwards, never any vision of the future. No one was selling truth or honesty, but there was plenty of prejudice, prejudice and imagined slight on offer. Plenty of gung-ho, hot-headed invective, very little sober reflection. Since then, however, we have all had a chance to take stock. Now, I, am, I know from hearing members today that they have, like me, spent time talking to constituents and will have received a range of different responses. I've had people who wanted to leave um, so that our laws would be made at home, but still wanted to keep freedom of movement. I spoke to one lady who didn't like the control that she thought the EU had over our lives, but thought we should have common standards for goods across Europe. There was no settled will of the people, no single movement, no collective decision-making. There was no plan to vote for, no manifesto to be held to, no vision of a new constitution. Any politician saying that they are simply respecting the will of the people is actually just hijacking an advisory plebiscite for their own personal or political advantage. 
Now, my constituency of Edinburgh, North and Leith is decidedly in favour of the EU. More than a quarter of the population signed the online petition to revoke Article 50. And that re reflects what is said to me across the constituency on a very regular basis. People worried about whether their doctor will be here in the future, concerned about whether their neighbours and friends will face pressure to leave. Uh, I have had countless representations from constituents concerned about how the community will be affected uh, if we no longer have the uh, flow of fresh faces and we cannot hang on to the new Edinburgh North and Leithers that we have. I mean, I've had the wife of the Regis Keeper of the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh contact me because she was concerned about her right to stay. Now, she hadn't worked much while she was bringing up their children. Her husband served with distinction in the Marines, invalided out in the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, and he's a member of the Queen's Bodyguard of the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms, but that cuts no ice. I've had a constituent who doesn't want to be named because she fears the repercussions uh, come to me in fear of being deported back to the EU county, country she left as a toddler to come to the UK, even before it joined the common market. She raised her family here. She currently looks after her grandchildren while her children work, but her status here is uncertain. Uh, yes, of course. Do you agree with me that there is a real risk of another windrush <coughs> situation developing if the government doesn't get a handle on this situation? The Honourable Lady is absolutely right, and this must be taken... I hope the Minister is hearing this, because this is something that concerns many people in my constituent, and I'm sure hers as well, uh, and across the United Kingdom uh, very greatly. It's, um, it really needs to be taken a grip of right now so that these people can be reassured. On that point? Yes, of course. Very good. can be very swift. Um, I'm sure the Honourable Lady can confirm that the substantial majority of the... Um, constituency are indeed EU nationals, as she said, but doesn't their um, angst about Article 50 in this situation actually show also their commitment to want to stay here and contribute to our society? Oh, absolutely. I completely associate myself with that comment. Um, I have been... Uh, my constituency is a particularly multi... Um, uh, multi-dimensional uh, constituency, but it's also um, very uh, a number of uh, ethnicities across the board, and it's something that I relish the most about my constituency and uh, the tremendous. I think perhaps going back hundreds of years, because of course Leith is a, a dock area, and uh, there's uh, I think this sort of embracing of new people to our shores uh, is particularly obvious in Edinburgh North and Leith, and I'm proud to be associated with that. Um, so the, uh, the, the sentiment that is repeated to me regularly um, by my constituent, with very few exceptions, is that they want to keep our links with the EU, preferably remaining a full member state. Now, it may be because we understand the benefits of the EU, and particularly the benefits of freedom of movement. And uh, I'm about to elaborate, it's just under 10% of the population are non-UK citizens of the EU. We have more than twice the average uh, UK concentration. We understand the benefits of immigration and the added cultural and economic value immigrants bring. We understand how damaging Brexit would be, particularly a chaotic Brexit. Parliament should heed such voices and we in this place have a duty to look out for their best interests. Now, we know that the deals uh, negotiated by successive legendary Brexit secretaries, who all seem to have resigned in disgust at their own failures, have been disowned three times, and the cock has not yet crowed. There will be no rehabilitation, and there is yet time for another denial if the deal is brought back a fourth time. And I hope that the Prime Minister is willing to listen to her advice of the Lord Chancellor from the weekend and acknowledge there is no chance of it passing and that she should be looking at other options. I certainly heartily recommend to her the revocation of the Article 50 notification letter, a judicial inquiry into the conduct of the 2016 <coughs> referendum and whatever follows from that. We could top it all off by, as I said previously, copying Ireland's Citizens' Assembly model to determine a way forward. What we should make certain of, however, is that no future referendum on such an important matter is allowed to proceed on the basis of hearsay, speculation, 
fevered invention and laden prejudice. A proper position based on things like facts and expert testimony should be laid out by anyone advocating major change. There are precedents for that. In any case, rev revoking Article 50 would seem to be the most sensible course of action. There is no point in trying to carry this nonsense further any f forward any further. Jenny Chapman. Thank you, Mr McCabe. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I would like to thank all the members who've contributed and made such excellent speeches with great passion and insight and it's great to be in a debate where MPs are so at one with their constituents over an issue. Um, I correct myself, though. I just called it a debate. Clearly, we haven't had a debate. Um, what we've had is a sharing of perspectives among people who broadly agree with one another. Um, and the counter-arguments um, haven't been heard because those who came initially to put them decided to leave. And... I'm sad about that, and I'm particularly sad that the, I think it was 175,000 people who signed the petition that we are meant to be discussing today too, on leaving um, with or without a deal, had their champions walked away today. And I, I think they need to reach their own conclusions about that, but I certainly regret that this hasn't been the opportunity it perhaps could have been. Um, for the kind of discussion that is possible in this space that sometimes isn't possible in the main chamber. And that can often be the beauty of these events in Westminster Hall as opposed to the main chamber of the House of Commons. And, and I regret that. Nevertheless, we've had outstanding speeches and I particularly thank my honourable friend, the member for Newcastle North, for introducing this debate so well <laughs> and so comprehensively. And I, I, I can... I think her constituents will be very proud of her for the job that she did today. And I know that many people here um, have heard her speak on this issue in the past, and she maintained that high standard of contribution this afternoon. But uh, excellent speeches, too, from the members for Dulwich and West Norwood, Bath, Nottingham East, York Central, Streatham, Swansea West, Linlithgow and East Falkirk, Hornsey and Wood Green, Stockport, East Lothian, Totnes, Bermondsey and Old Southwark, and Edinburgh North and Leith. Um, I, I think that the, I mean, it's, there's no doubt, is there, that the three petitions that we're here to discuss re represent a range of views um, from across the country, and they range from those who want to immediately revoke Article 50 and stay in the EU. Um, to those who want to have already left last week with or without a deal. And they also include those who want to hold another referendum between the Prime Minister's deal and Remain. And I recognise, of course, uh, that one of those petitions has received astronomical, unprecedented support. And I, I don't think that we can just deal with each of these petitions equally in this session because of the, the overwhelming support that one uh, has received, uh, and it's something that we've never seen before. Um, I hope that it's a trend that continues. It's great to see so many people take part in a process that really, until Brexit um, came about, wasn't really getting much traction with the public. But my goodness, people do seem to know about it now. And the strength of feeling um, that many people have shown on this um, is something that we just can't dismiss. Six million signatures is an enormous amount. Um, and even if we accept um, that not everybody who signed it did so with exactly the same motives as one another, I think there is a very clear message that comes from such a large number of people taking time to sign a petition. I give way to the Honourable Lady. I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. Would she clarify what Labour's position is tonight in terms of vo voting in favour of the revoke, um, law, the revoke amendment? Yes. Um, we're, we're, we're treating tonight as an opportunity to vote for something, so a way to try and find whether or not there's a majority in the House of Commons for a particular deal as a way forward. We don't disagree necessarily with the um, proposition that's been made by the Honourable Lady for Edinburgh South, but... Um, we're going to be abstaining on that this evening while acknowledging that it, it's something that we may need to confront 
in the future. Sure, I'll give away again. Um, uh, is, that a, is that a whipped abstention or an advisory? Oh, bit? gosh. The um, Honourable Lady invites me to um, make uh, comments way above my station. And what happens with whipping is something that is a matter for my chief whip. I'm sure she'll understand. Um, and I, I'm not... I don't know um, the exact position as far as how we're going to enforce it. But I, I shall be abstaining on it this evening um, as a shadow minister. Um, but I am... I'm trying, you know, I hope that she will take in good faith what I'm explaining, but I do recognise, as do my colleagues, I'm sure, that that decision point may be something we need to confront in the future, but it's not something that we need to do tonight, because tonight, for us, is about trying to find a majority for a way forward that we can hopefully um, arrive at this evening. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. So um, I can confirm that my party has a free vote um, on this, apart from members of the Cabinet who seem to be abstaining. Um, uh, uh, something I don't quite understand myself, I have to say. Um, but is the Honourable Lady saying that her party is abstaining whilst trying to talk up a petition of six million people who wanted something else? Well, I am saying that um, we are... I'm admiring of the petition, and I'm respecting of the petition, and I'm understanding of the reasons for the petition. I'm also not discounting the proposition put this evening. Um, the fact that I'm not voting for it this evening, I don't think the minister needs to read too much into that. All I would add is that we on this side will be whipping our um, members this evening, our colleagues this evening, unlike the government, who daren't even try and whip its own cabinet. And if I were the minister, I'm not sure I'd be bobbing up and down quite as much as he is on this particular issue this evening. <laughs> I was, I would give way to my other friend. I thank my friend for giving way. Um, uh, perhaps some clarification would help. My understanding is that there is no whip for Labour and Peace on, the, on this particular uh, vote, and there will be many of us joining uh, colleagues from across the House, and I'm sure the minister, in supporting revoking Article 50. Well, I'm grateful for my honourable friend's advice, uh, which I'm sure he would have been doing regardless of advice from his colleagues in the Whip's office. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think what I interpret from the fact that six million people, um, and thousands of them in my own constituency too, um, have, have said by signing this petition, you know, it's just how concerned and angry and frustrated people are at the way the Brexit process has been mishandled by the government. And I, I just don't think we've seen the same level of support for a petition and for it to have real public cut through at any other stage in this process. I give one way to my old friend. Does she believe that in the last two weeks since the figures have come out that it's costing 600 to 800 million per week? might have influenced some people in terms of signing the petition? As opposed to 12 months ago. Oh, well, I think there's definitely more a sense of urgency now. And I think people feel that if they are going to have their voice heard and, and make their case, that they need to do it now, perhaps in a way that they didn't feel um, previously. Did my honourable friend from East... Uh, yeah, I thank, thank my honourable friend for giving way. Um, she talked about some of the anger that there is out there. Um, does she uh, agree with me that there is a lot of anger from some of the people who voted Leave as well? Um, that if we believe in democracy and if we want to make sure that we can deal with this anger on both sides from people who feel that they're being ignored, the only way we're going to be able to do that is to have another vote in order to enable people to uh, vote on what are fixed propositions rather than simply nebulous concepts. I mean, I do agree that there is anger on both sides. And one of the things that I think, um, you know, cred I would give credit to colleagues in this debate that we haven't always heard is that colleagues have been at pains to ensure that it is understood that when they talk about um, the far right or the, the scenes that we saw outside Parliament that last Friday, that they in no way characterise all Leave supporters um, in that way. And, you know, that has happened in the past, and it's a very good thing, I think, that we haven't seen that this afternoon. Um, and I, I, I credit my honourable friends here for making sure that they didn't 
um, in any way allow that perception uh, to be taken away from this debate this afternoon. Um, but this petition, and also the number of people we've seen signing other petitions and on marches and on protests in recent weeks, I think one of the things it shows is just how many people feel left out or ignored by this process, and that has to be, I think, down to the fact that the Prime Minister, after the referendum, was very quick to say, I'm going to stand up for one side of this argument and one side alone, and the 52% are going to get what they want and to hell with everybody else. And I think that's a dreadful way to attempt to lead, lead a country, and surely one of the things that a Prime Minister ought to have done in that situation is try and work through a way that is respectful to the outcome, but actually listens and includes and bears in mind the concerns and the anxieties and what the 48% were trying to say too. Both sides, in a democracy, I get elected, I don't just represent people who vote Labour. You know, I don't check how people voted before I work on their behalf. We're here to serve the whole country, however they vote at elections and however they voted in this referendum. But what people are seeing at the moment is they think they're seeing that Westminster just isn't working. And they see a Prime Minister that rather than listen to different views, just keeps putting a same deal back to Parliament, hoping for a different result. And they hope that the I hope well, I hope that the Minister reflects on this a bit in his remarks, and maybe he'll set out how the government plans to go forward. I, I mean, we've been in a few of these, the Minister and I, and I, I don't get my hopes up. However, you never know. Um, but as for the specifics of the petitions, um, the first one to revoke, as I've said, we recognise the huge level of public support for this petition and why it's touched a nerve with so many people. And that any discussion around revoking Article 50, I think, would have to be considered in the context of it being a final choice between that and leaving without a deal. And we recognise that given the government's intransigence, that we could get to that point. I mean, it's I mean that, that was almost inconceivable a year ago. But I, I have in mind particularly the contribution made by the member for West Dorset, I think, in uh, oh, one of the debates that we've had in the last couple of weeks, where he said that he used to think the Prime Minister wouldn't take us out without a deal, but that he no longer holds that view. And he knows her far better than than any of us do, and that's his assessment, that she would actually consider taking us out without a deal. So for that reason, um, to make as a final choice, obviously, revoking Article 50 would be preferable to leaving without a deal. But we're not there yet, and I'm glad we're not there yet. I hope we never get to that point. Our clear preference is for Parliament to have the time and the opportunity to debate credible alternatives that can command a majority in Parliament. <coughs> and we're seeing the next stage of that today in the main chamber. I wish that it had begun earlier, um, and I hope it can make progress. I don't think this is something that um, backbenchers should have had to initiate for themselves. The government should have initiated this or a similar kind of process two years ago so that a mandate was found for the government on which they could negotiate and which Parliament would be obliged to engage with if she'd managed to successfully negotiate it. That isn't what happened. You know, but we are, unfortunately, in a situation now where we've had to, to take control as parliamentarians. And I do hope that we produce a positive outcome today and there's something comes out of this exercise. Um, so, but we we'll, shall see at about 10 o'clock this evening, I think. Um, but to be honest, revoking Article 50 at this stage and without consulting the public um, in either a general election or a referendum, which is what the petition's asking for, I don't think that that would bring the country back together. I can understand why people have got so frustrated that that's the conclusion they've reached, but I don't think without having some kind of democratic process um, that that would actually achieve the, the reunification that surely we should all um, desire. So it's not the preferred approach at the moment, but I recognise that it's an issue that we might need to return to in the future. I know that that won't be enough for some colleagues, but um, that I hope that that's a, a straightforward uh, an explanation of our position 
Um, uh, it was the most straightforward I can manage anyway. Um, but turning to the second peti petition, which calls for the referendum on the Prime Minister's deal, um, Labour would support a public vote, and we're calling it a confirmatory ballot uh, to prevent a damaging uh, Tory Brexit or no deal. Um, and we don't do this, you know, most colleagues here, we've had several discussions over the months about the desirability or otherwise of another referendum. Um, I give way to my honourable friend. Thank you. I just wonder if uh, you could confirm that that confirmatory vote would have remain on the ballot paper. I don't really see any point of having going through another exercise such as that without having remain on the ballot paper. Um, everybody seems to have their own personal view on exactly what ought to be on any, on any such ballot paper, whether it should include two options, three options, single stage, multiple stage. But the principle um, of engaging the public further in that decision, um, I think, is something that is gaining in support. Um, I don't know if it yet has a majority. Perhaps we'll find out later today. But the specifics of what goes on a ballot paper, I think, is something that would very quickly need to be resolved and there would need to be a process in Parliament to, to help inform that. But yes, I, I, um, I would say that if you don't have Remain on the ballot paper, really, you know, it's difficult to see the, the benefit of the exercise. Um, but we, we, we've spent two years making the case for a Brexit approach that we believe could have commanded support in the Commons um, but I have to recognise that at this late stage, if the Prime Minister forces through her deal, probably after multiple meaningful votes, that that would need further confirmation from the public, as would any deal that comes at the 11th hour from the indicative vote process. We've also said um, that we would include Remain as the default option against a credible leave option. So we sympathise with this petition, especially the part in the petition where it says, whether you voted leave or remain, you didn't vote for us to leave the EU in disarray with no deal, putting many people's livelihoods and living um, situations at risk. And that brings me to the final petition, which calls for the UK to leave deal or no deal. Now, I represent a seat that voted 56% to leave, and I have many friends and members of my close family who voted to leave too. So I know how strongly many people feel about this. But leaving without a deal, I don't believe that that is what voters were promised in 2016. And I don't think it would be in the best interest of our country or in the best interest of mine or anybody else's constituents. It would cause huge damage to jobs, the economy and trade and create enormous difficulties in Northern Ireland. So that's why Labour's always said that we'll not countenance no deal, and why we'll be putting forward options to prevent it. So just to conclude, you know, I would like to thank everyone again for taking part in this debate, but most of all, it is all these debates are always primarily about the people who sign the petitions. You know, we couldn't have this, these events if it weren't for so many people taking part and putting their names to petitions and it's great to see it when they people attend as well and actually make time to be here and I know that some people will have maybe traveled a long way to, to be here today um, and if there is one upside it's sometimes hard to find an upside but if there is one upside in the last two years it's that people are more engaged uh, than ever in what happens in this place and they are more keen to participate and today, I'm very pleased, Mr McCabe, I'm very pleased that their voices have been heard. Thank you. Minister Chris Heaton Harris. Um, thank you, uh, Mr McCabe. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. It's a first for me, and I shall try and be as well behaved as I like to think I normally am. And if you could pass on, um, I think, everyone's thanks to Mr Gray, who chaired the first part of the session. And I'd like to obviously say it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Honourable Lady, the Member for Newcastle upon Tyne North, for opening the debate on behalf of the Petitions Committee in the, in the uh, uh, amazingly courteous and polite way that she did, um, taking into account all the petitions 
um, appropriately. Um, I'm, she, like me, I'm sure, is um, pleased that there have been a number of people in the public gallery for uh, this debate. Um, I'd like to thank them both for being here and also not for what people in the main gallery of the chamber have been doing this afternoon, which is stripping off to make a point. Um, so I very much appreciate your attendance and your clothes. Um, I'd, uh, the, when the, the Honourable Lady for Newcastle upon Tyne North spoke, she d does it in a, and she always does this, and I admire her for it, in a very an honest and brave way. She represents a seat that voted leave uh, in quite some number, 56.8% um, or something like that, I believe. Um, not that I checked these figures. But of course, I happily give way to them. So um, I'd be interested to know where the minister got that figure from, mm. because officially Newcastle as a city voted remain and the um, votes were all counted on a city-wide basis. So there is no breakdown for my constituency. Yeah. So I'm wondering if the minister has been reading the Daily Mail. I, I, I always read the paper that my mother reads. Um, it's very important to know where she's going to come at me from next time. Um, so uh, I, I apologise if that is not the correct figure, but I still maintain the, the point that the Honourable Lady is an honest and brave parliamentarian. Happily give way. Giving way. Um, I do know the uh, or estimated percentage of uh, my constituents who voted leave. It was 56.7% who voted leave. Uh, however, I have told them uh, that my role is to represent their best interests, and that is what I am trying to do. And I'm trying to represent all of their best interests, not just the people who voted for me, but the people who didn't vote for me, and not just the people who voted leave, but also the people who voted remain. Yeah. I think that's a completely honourable position for the honourable gentleman to take. And similarly, um, honourable as the honourable lady for Newcastle upon Tyne uh, North. I mean, she um, has been quite straightforward throughout this whole protest, uh, process. She, um, as she uh, as said, she did not vote to activate Article 50, um, and she's been quite um, outspoken sometimes, but in a very polite way about the process that we've gone along in this House. I hear she's had many conversations in her, in her seat. Many people uh, in this debate talked about the many conversations they'd have with Leave voters. And there are lots of different reasons why people did vote to leave. Um, so you cannot say that they all, everybody came behind one reason. Actually, there are lots of different reasons to vote to remain um, as well. For leave voters, it might be setting our own laws, having them set by this place and not by uh, the European Commission. It might be spending our, our money on our own choices. Um, it might be about ending freedom of movement. There are a number of people today who might be voting for this um, customs union or whatever it is, single market 2.0, uh, common market 2.0 option. Uh, no, in knowing full well, that means continuing freedom of movement um, that might well be against um, something that their voters uh, were quite strongly opposed to. Um, uh, it might be, uh, people might have been uh, voting for, and a number have uh, said this over the last couple of years, concerned about how their wages have deflated against overall wage growth. Uh, there are a huge number of reasons why people voted for the way, in the way they did, and they are all legitimate. And we must not debase the legitimacy of people's actions. I'm, I'm very pleased the Honourable Lady was uh, proud of the uh, people demonstrating uh, last week. I'm quite sure she was proud to have the full and uncompromising support of her party leader um, at the front of the march. Oh, he wasn't there, was he? Um, I think he was in Morecambe. Um, so um, maybe, you know, nearly um, led from the front by uh, her party leader. Um, obviously, we have a number of interventions in this debate. We had 19 uh, people intervene, uh, Mr. McCabe, which I, uh, I think is the most um, that I have uh, in, in many of these petition debates that um, the Honourable Lady for Darlington talked about, we've been in uh, before um, here, uh, it's, it's quite nice to have a full house uh, of people, even on one side, talking about it, um, because it is, these are very important decisions that we are making on behalf of people. So uh, I thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for Nottingham East for his uh, contribution. Um, I like to know, when, as long as he's on the other side to me, I'm, I, I feel good. I feel, no, I, I, he's, he's a very good uh, gentleman, and um, I understand his view entirely on, on this. Um, he mentioned, actually, that this debate should have been in the main chamber. I have no disagreement with that whatsoever. I think when 
uh, maybe the petition committee could look in the future at when you get so many people, over a million, whatever it might be, sign a petition that the, the best place for it would be on the floor of the House itself. So I, I, I'm in agreement with him uh, uh, there, but obviously it's a House matter, and so it's up to the petitions committee themselves and how, how they go about that. Oh, of course. Um, just as a point of um, fact, um, it's not up to the petitions committee where the debates are held. The petitions committee has an allocated slot on a Monday afternoon here in Westminster Hall, and this is where we are allowed to hold the debates that we then decide have passed the relevant thresholds. And obviously it would be a matter for, I don't know, the House authorities to negotiate how that might be, how that might be changed. But, but there is, it is purely a matter of the procedure that the committee has at its disposal that we have it here in Westminster Hall. Well, I'm, I'm sure, I, I, I hear what the Honourable Lady says, and I'm sure, um, I mean, we, we do have a speaker uh, who believes in the evolution of parliamentary process at a very speedy rate. Um, so uh, I'm sure there is, is a, a way that uh, very popular uh, petitions in the future can get um, uh, time on the floor of the House. And I don't, I don't think anybody would necessarily disagree with that. The process might be slightly more interesting for behind the scenes, but that's one for those who deal with those matters. Um, I thank the Honourable Lady for York Central, Bath, Dulwich and West Normand. Um, uh, the Honourable Member for Streatham, who I will spar with one day on no deal preparation, because actually um, no deal preparation has gone uh, well, much better than the Honourable Gentleman might care to make it. I'd love to take an intervention from the Honourable Lady on that point. Thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way on no deal preparation. One of the things that has been quite frustrating, however, is the use of non-disclosure agreements, gag gagging clauses. It's very difficult for the Health and Social Care Committee to assess the extent to which no deal planning for medicine supplies has been a success as, as people have had to sign these, these agreements. Um, would he be prepared to actually sweep those out of the way so that we can actually yeah, yeah. see whether yeah, there is yeah, adequate yeah. planning for supplies of vital medicines and medical equipment in the event of no deal? Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for, for that. Maybe she missed the email update to 19,000 doctors by Professor, Professor Russell Viner uh, last week, the president of the Royal College of, uh, College of Pediatrics and Child Health. And I quote... Um, I know that many of you will have been watching the news about Brexit with feelings of uncertainty and increasing alarm. I've been, I've been considerably reassured by the government's preparations relating to medicine supplies. The government, the Medicine and Healthcare Product Re Regulatory Agency and the NHS have been working hard behind the scenes and we believe our medicine supplies are very largely secured. Um, his biggest concern obviously was panic buying and as far as I'm aware, and the Honourable Lady, I'd, I'd happily take this um, up with her offline, um, uh, I, as far as I'm aware, um, NDAs are not a, 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 in practice, um, uh, going, uh, haven't been a practice of, uh, of no deal preparation for quite some time. But I'll, I'll happily uh, correspond with the Honourable Lady or maybe have a conversation with her afterwards about that, because if she has concerns on that matter, I'd like to um, bring them into the open a tiny bit. Everybody um. who's been asked not to disclose any issues to do with the supply of medicines is at liberty to now disclose them. Uh, I, I've said what well, I've said in public, and I'll happily take this up with the Honourable Lady um, after this uh, meeting. Um, I'd like, also like to thank the Honourable Gentleman for Swansea West. Um, yeah, Swansea West. Um, Lynn Lithgow for, and for, uh, for Kirk Hornsey and Wood Green, uh, uh, Honourable Lady for Hornsey and Wood Green, Honourable Lady for uh, Stockport, Honourable uh, Gentleman for East Lothian, the Honourable Lady for Top Ness, um, who I know quoted a whole host of um, uh, reasons as to why she's allowed to change her mind. Um, I won't go back and, and quote all the things she said to her electorate in the 2017 uh, general election. The Honourable Gentleman for Bermondsey and Old, uh, Old Southwark, uh, Honourable Lady for Edinburgh and North and Leith, who missed um, the point that wages are actually rising ahead of inflation at this point in time. And obviously the Honourable Lady for uh, Darlington, um, who informed us of the whipping um, for uh, Labour uh, uh, at this point. Um, but obviously I'd like to thank, more importantly, the number of people who have expressed them, uh, themselves to the government in the three petitions that we've had here, we have debated here today. 
these petitions ask us to both, uh, both reverse the 2016 referendum, re referendum results, whether by revoking Article 50 or by holding a second referendum, as well as the exact opposite, um, that this government ensures uh, that we deliver the outcome of the 2016 referendum result no matter what. The government's position remains clear. We will not revoke Article 50 and we will not hold a second referendum. We remain committed to leaving the European Union and implementing the result of the 2016 referendum. And now, actually, Parliament's position is also clear. In the series of indicative votes on March the 27th, Parliament voted on the options of revoking Article 50 and holding a second referendum. Neither option achieved a majority in the House. Indeed, the House voted with a majority of more than 100 against revoking Article 50. However, the government really does acknowledge the substantial number of signatures that these petitions have amassed, and we recognise the thousands of people who marched, hundreds of thousands of people who marched um, in London on the 23rd of March in favour of a second referendum. In particular, and I don't think anybody did do this, but I would like to congratulate Margaret Ann Georgiadou, who was the creator of the revocation petition, uh, the revocation of Article 50 uh, petition, for starting a pe uh, petition that uh, current counters attracted over 6 million signatures. This is a considerable achievement in anybody's terms. And I'd also like to take a moment to note that I, uh, I, the government, and I'm sure everybody in this room, was disgusted to hear reports that Ms. Georgia Du uh, had received uh, threats uh, and abuse for e just starting a petition. Uh, this is utterly unacceptable and everyone should feel and be able to express their opinions and participate in political discourse without fear of in in intimidation and abuse. It's integral to our democracy and it should be at the front and centre of our minds when we debate and discuss all issues, including Brexit. And it is these democratic values that underpin the government's commitment to uphold the results of the 2016 referendum. Though this is a process that I have elaborated on before, let me do so again to reinforce exactly uh, why it is we must uphold the result. In 2015, Parliament voted overwhelmingly to give the British people a choice on whether to remain in or leave the European Union, allowing them to express a clear view to government. Before we asked them to vote, this government wrote to every household committing to implement whatever decision they made. On the 23rd of June 2016, the British people expressed their view to government. With nearly three quarters of the electorate taking part, 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union. It's the highest number of votes cast in any single, for any single course of action in UK electoral history. More British people than ever before or since amassed in agreement on a single clear outcome, that they wanted government to deliver the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. And of course, Parliament also made a commitment to uphold the result of the 2016 referendum. In the 2017 general election, British people cast their votes again, with over 80% of those uh, who voted voting for parties who committed in their manifestos to uphold the result of the referendum. I'll happily, <laughs> I, I will happily give way to all three. I'll start with the Honourable Gentleman. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. I refrained from raising this in my speech. But it's also right to say that the Conservatives stood on a manifesto that said you would not separate the withdrawal agreement from the political declaration. So how can you keep to one bit of the manifesto and not the other bit further on in the same paragraph? And then I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman for Streatham. Okay. Yeah, I was going to take all, sorry, I was going to all take right, I think the minister might want to reply. Look, the, the, the point is that the minister continues to ignore is the reason why he and his government are in the mess that they're in, which is that ultimately the 2016 referendum gave a view on whether or not a majority of people participating in the referendum wanted to leave the European Union. But how people wanted to leave the European Union was reserved to Parliament. Now, his government put a very hard Brexit to the British people and lost its majority. And it's the clash of those two mandates which is why we are going through all this chaos right now. And yet again, he is sticking his head in the sand and ignoring that fact. It's all very well asserting the result of the referendum, but it didn't tell us how the country wanted to leave the European Union. That has been the essential problem in this process. Yeah, yeah. 
Forgive me for not answering the gentleman's point. I was going to take all three, but let me just uh, do, uh, do it as the Honourable Gentleman for Streatham would want uh, to, it to be done. Um, our manifesto was quite clear. The Honourable Gentleman's manifesto uh, was, was quite clear. Of, uh, and, I, uh, and, I, uh, and we are want, uh, my party wants to deliver on our manifesto commitment. Uh, to the Honourable Gentleman um, for Streatham, Things did move on, absolutely, between 2016 and 2017, which is why his party then and my party then made the commitments they did in that manifesto, because people understood that we would be leaving the single market and the customs union. Oh, yeah, absolutely. On, on, on that point, though, look, the minister is also ignoring what his own chief whip will be saying on BBC Two later this evening, which is that the government has refused to alter course, change its red lines in light of the fact that it lost its majority mm -hmm. and it cannot get measures, propositions through the House of Commons. That is, that's why you're in the mess you're in. Um, I, I tend to disagree. Firstly, I obviously haven't seen a programme that is yet to be aired yet. Um, it's not like, yeah, well... I, it's, it's, it's so, uh, uh, you know, forgive me, it is a tiny bit busy at this moment in time, and I will obviously watch every word and re uh, read every word that my chief, uh, my, the government chief whip uh, might say and, and put it in the context that it might have been said. Um, however, uh, in 2017, at the general election, now he might not have enjoyed reading his manifesto, I might not have enjoyed reading mine, um, but... Uh, but uh, but, no, uh, but people quite rightly said, and I, I canvassed across the country in, from Bolsover to Coventry South, to a lot of time in my own seat, obviously, uh, Northampton, swathes of South London, um, where people quite rightly thought, when, the, when uh, doors were knocked on, that Brexit was actually in the process of being delivered because everybody kind of agreed that they were going to respect the result of the referendum. And yes, I do believe there has been a bit of a de democratic disconnect but in a slightly different way to the way that the Honourable Gentleman believes so. Uh, the Honourable, sorry, the Honourable Lady, did, did you, no? Nope. Okay. Um, there's an Honourable Lady at the back. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for him to give way. The one thing that I struggle with is if the Prime Minister says with so much passion and conviction that her deal is what the people voted for in 2016, why is she so very worried to put it back to the people if it is what she believes is what people voted for? She should be proudly presenting her deal and just check with the people that that is what they voted for. I'll happily come back and answer that point later on in my speech. I, I, the Honourable Gentleman wanted to intervene. Sure, yeah, just a quick question. You know, the Minister seems to be struggling to split the hypothetical versus the, what actually happened in the election. So um, perhaps the Minister has the figures for the number of people who downloaded or bought the Conservative manifesto. But it, to, sim to suggest simplistically that, that, that the vast majority of voters read any party manifesto, is, it, we all know that to be untrue. And the practical reality in constituencies like mine is every leaflet that I put out, every interview, every article I gave, the hustings, I said I will continue to oppose Brexit full stop. So, you know, it, it's, it's complete falsehood to pretend that uh, in the election voters only voted knowing that Brexit would be delivered. It's just a nonsense. Uh, so I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his point. But in a way, he, he makes the point I was trying to make to the Honourable Gentleman for Stratton, because people did pay attention to what individual MPs were saying um, in their constituencies, or at least I'd like to think so, because I, more people attended hustings than ever before in, in, in my constituency, uh, and I'd like to think that was reflected um, elsewhere in, in various hustings. Um, but the disconnect comes because lots of people do vote in the end, and he does know this, for a party before an individual. And if your party nationally is saying something loud and clear, well, then actually you're almost disrespecting your party's own manifesto by saying something differently locally. Well, uh, well, that uh, thank, thank the Minister for giving way. Surely the point of a manifesto is to let the voters know what you will do if and when you form a government. And we, we wrote our manifesto in the hope and expectation that we would be able to form a government and carry through the manifesto that we wrote. Unfortunately, uh, I believe, unfortunately for the British people, we were not able to form that government, and so we were not able to take control of the Brexit process. Clearly, over the last two years, 
uh, the present government haven't been able to take control of it either. Uh, but uh, we, you can hardly blame us, and I don't believe that the electorate should be able to blame us for the fact that you have not been able to control your own members and you have not been able to bring forward a feasible and viable Brexit process. So I, 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 um, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his contribution, and I, I don't think I was actually blaming him us, the collective we here, I was just making the point of what people might well have expected. Because it's not just, it's not just a, a government, but many of the colleagues who stood on these manifestos promising to uphold the, man, the results of the referendum, who have an obligation and a mandate to do so. And I'll happily give way to the Honourable Lady. Right. Honourable uh, Lady. Yes. Um, would, would the Honourable Gentleman agree with me that it was the publication of the manifesto that was, in fact, the tipping point for the Conservatives? It was all going quite well until the manifesto, and then it fell off a cliff. That was uh, certainly my experience. Uh, well, I, I, I guess I should... Um, I, I said I would... You know, um, the problem is, is that people sometimes don't like it when politicians say one thing and then do... Another. I think we all recognise that, and it's a difficulty that we all might have at some point in the future. But when you go around saying in the course of a general election, this constituency voted by 54% to leave, I think this is one of the things that annoys people, is telling them they didn't know what they were voting for. That was the purpose of the referendum, and we accept the result. We have to go into this absolutely understanding the principle um, that, uh, here that is we respect the outcome of the referendum and I think it would be a huge mistake to go into promising uh, that I would be prepared to vote actively to overturn the deal and send us back into Europe is what the Honourable Lady said to her constituents. I'll happily give way. Can I just remind the Minister that we are being observed here by members of the public in the gallery and also many people watching this at home because they have a certain level of engagement with this debate perhaps more than others and what they don't want to see is an attempt just to undermine one by one members who've made a case on behalf of the petitioners today. What they would really like to see is the Minister address the substance of the petition. Here, here. Which is what I'd started uh, to do. Failing to deliver on the commitments that we as politicians have made to the people we serve would be hugely damaging. And let me... Uh, yes, I have you. The Minister for giving way. Um, the Minister talks of uh, commitment to um, people's original voting intentions, but at the very least, surely the accusations and indeed proof of illegal activity undertaken by the Vote Leave campaign mean that a reconsideration of that vote is entirely appropriate from the government. I'm afraid I completely disagree. And let me be clear. To revoke Article 50 or to hold a second referendum would be failing to deliver on the commitments that we, we have made. Parliament last week again rejected uh, these uh, motions. Second guessing or otherwise reversing the outcome of the 2016 vote damages trust, uh, the trust that British people place in its government. It gives cause for British people to lose faith in politics, in politicians, and lose faith in the most important democratic process of all, which is voting. Now, I recognise in the midst of this uncertainty that the petitioners question why the British people shouldn't have a chance to have a second say on Brexit, um, a second vote on Brexit. But let me uh, ask this. If we cannot show that we will uphold the, and respect the result of one referendum, what guarantees uh, would, could, could we give to, that we'd respect and uphold the results of a second? Would we need a third? Is it best out of five? What, preve what prevents a third referendum still? Would then the uncertainty, the back and forth of asking the question, end? When could we consider ourselves to have settled the question? This government believes that we have settled the question. It was settled by the British people in the 2016 referendum. To question that vote and to try and undermine what was expressed in that vote is a harmful precedent to set. And it is one that the government is firmly unwilling to set. Um, but what people have expressed to us through these petitions is an important message. Through it, we recognise the frustrations and concerns caused by the current uncertainty. It's our view, and it's Parliament's view, um, as expressed in the, in the votes, numerous votes last week in the indicative vote process, uh, that the solution is not to revoke Article 50 or hold a second referendum, therefore irreparably damaging the relationship between people and politics, but to try and move forward with certainty as we deliver on the instruction that was given to us, which is, why, which is what this government is trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Kay.
Catherine McKenna. Thank you, uh, Mr McCabe. And um, I thank the Minister for that reply. And I was um, perhaps being a little unfair on him when I picked him up on his reference to Newcastle North being a Leave constituency, because, as um, my honourable friend pointed out, there are projected figures in terms of demographic analysis. And I know from the conversations I had on many, many doors during the referendum campaign that there were many of my constituents that um, were voting leave. The point is, and I think it gets forgotten in this entire debate, and I think the, the discussion and the level of debate that we've had from the government benches throughout this debate, which has been disappointing in terms of engagement with the substance of the issue, a reality check on where we are, rather than going round in ever-decreasing circles with tit-for-tat arguing about how we got here. We know how we got here. There was a referendum question put to the country that did not specify in any way how it would be delivered. And we had a government that went ahead and held a um, general election and lost its majority. And we have a Prime Minister who has completely failed to engage with anyone but those within her own party um, on this issue and to reach out and form a consensus. So we know why we are where we are. And I, like my honourable friend, uh, the member for Darlington, was very disappointed that the few Conservative members that attended the debate initially, and I gave them many, many opportunities to intervene, got up and left before the end of this debate. And they didn't make any actual substantive contribution. And if I'm perfectly honest, their contributions to the debate were like um, a school debating club with point scoring rather than engaging with the substance. And I just marvel in horror when we find Conservative members of Parliament dismissing out of hand um, the concerns expressed by the CBI, by the Chambers of Commerce, right up and down the country, that the facts around a no-deal Brexit put so many of our jobs and industries at risk that they are not ready and they have said that with absolute clarity and the fact that um, we now have this you know the, the conservative party used to pride itself on being the party of business and now it's just dismissing the concerns of businesses um, out, out, off, out, of, out of hand and just not you know treating it as if they are of no relevance um, in terms of their Brexit preparations and their concerns about a no-deal Brexit. And that is how we have ended up with this petition. And to try and dismiss it as some kind of assault on democracy, which we saw from some of the contributions, is not only deeply insulting to every single member of the public who has taken the trouble to go and sign on that petition's website, but it is also ignoring the deep gnawing anxiety of so many people in our country that are terrified of the prospects of a no-deal Brexit and want to know that as politicians, as members of parliament, as a government, we will not stand by whilst that happens to our country and with all the consequences that it will bring. And anyone that stands there and says, I have no fear of a no-deal Brexit, it'll be absolutely fine clearly has nothing to lose and is completely insulated. But I know that my constituents are not. And I go back to the point that the, cons uh, the minister made about my constituency being a leave constituency. We don't know, is the honest answer. It was calculated as a city. So we know Newcastle voted remain very marginally. But what I do know is, as a member of parliament that represents, lives in, my children grow up in, the constituency where I live, I will not do anything where all of the evidence, the government's own analysis, um, all the evidence points to it damaging the prospects of my constituency. So even if it meant not getting re-elected, but if, to know that I have done the right thing in terms of 
um, the, all the evidence that I am presented with and make a decision on that basis, that's the only basis upon which I make this decision. And the reason, so that is the reason why this revoked petition has been so popular. But also, it's the reason why the call for a confirmatory referendum on whatever Brexit deal the government arrives at has also gained so much support. Because I completely recognise, and so do my colleagues, that there was a vote to leave the European Union. But how that happens was not decided upon. That's something that Parliament has to decide. We've seen the evidence. We've seen that every single Brexit option will make our constituents poorer. And those in the North East, it will impact the most. Therefore, my view is, and the view of many colleagues who will support this amendment tonight, is that we should therefore allow Parliament to have that process, then to pass it back through Parliament and give it back to the people to make the final decision, given they started this process in 2015, they can now make the final decision on, sorry, 2016, they can now make a decision on how it ends. And that is how I will find out whether this is a Brexit that my constituents support, because they will have the opportunity to vote for it in a referendum, in a referendum that every single citizen in this country who can vote can take part in. And that is a democratic resolution to this impasse that we find ourselves in Parliament. We know how we got here. We know how to get out of it. And it's about time the government stopped burying its head in the sand and going round and round in circles and engaging in this debate that is not taking us anywhere forward. It is only leaving us stuck in this Brexit chaos. So I implore the minister, rather than engaging in the tit for tat, which I think is driving the country to distraction, that we actually compromise and come to a, an agreement that Parliament cannot take this historic decision without that, clar that, that um, confidence Order. that it is something that the Order. public support. The sitting stands adjourned. <laughs>